Hello folks and welcome to our game with myself Shane Stapleton, joined as ever by Michael Verney and Keane Johnson as well. We're huge about to talk about over the weekend, what a pulsating weekend of league f- uh, football final it was. Uh, just a reminder, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code OURGAME and you'll get 15% off. By the way, if you're interested in our club fundraisers, uh, we've got a brilliant one coming up in the Dome in Turles, looking ahead to the Hurland Championship. John Milan, Kieran Carey, Eddie Brennan and Seamus Callan are going to be there. So, so scan the QR code. We'll be tweeting it out again. Um, details about the show. Michael, just uh, if we're to look at the results flat out from the, the weekend in terms of the league football final, Derry 318, Dublin 221. And I know it's, you know, a bank holiday has passed now and everything, you know, so there's been a bit more time to let it percolate. The fact that it ended on penalties, I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't agree with you about big championship games maybe ending on penalties, but a league final I have no issue with whatsoever. Um, Ash, it was, it was kind of the game that had it all, really. Derry had it won probably twice, nearly lost it twice. And if they had lost it in the wind-up, it would have been a bit of a you know, a kidney punch to take for them. But to win it in the manner that they did and even win it on penalties and show their, their now a penalty taken yet again and to take down the dubs and be the better team, really, throughout you'd have to say um it's it's kind of livened up even the summer was always going to be interesting anyway but it's kind of a nice little kickstart towards summer where you're thinking okay dublin are actually um can actually be beaten here and there's a realistic contender and you know what i loved as well the bit just a bit of needle and lads pulling at each other and grabbing at each other and a few red cards here and there they'll meet again fingers crossed anyway at some stage towards the latter end of the summer and you know, they'll be skin and hair flying again. So there's a nice little rivalry set up. They've met each other a few times now. And this is probably the, and I just, it was fascinating. I know Keane will go into it here. Just fascinating to see nearly one on one, or man on man, nearly all over the pitch as well. There was a, there was a hell of a lot to digest. And it was a, it was probably the saving grace of the weekend's action, realistically. We probably needed a big football game uh, just to re-energise people's thoughts even on the game and what's coming you know down the line in summer and it definitely did it did that in spades it was a fascinating watch Keen, like this that game between and uh, actually the finale of Donegal against Armagh but this game in particular Derry against Dublin this was the dream we were all sold when we first picked up a, a Gaelic football as young lads that's the sort of stuff not the dross where it's over and back constantly and there is bits of that obviously but this is what we want this is what we dream of yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it was refreshing to see kind of like man on man play brought back. Like, and like mo- most teams nowadays will kind of set up their kind of line of engagement around the 45, and it kind of invites teams on. But, like, I, I think Michael, you were at the game, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, like uh, it, it seemed anyway from watching on telly, like it was the, they were kind of setting up around the 65 or maybe midfield, like on both sides, they weren't really dropping. And like that lends itself to a, a better game because when the ball's turned over, you don't have as far to go. And um, you know, with the pace and that both teams have, you know, it was it was keeping them both honest and like they both kind of tried to keep a small bit of traditional shape as well, like with Lachlan Murray and Shane McGuigan and then Con and Basquiat on the other side. So when it was turned over, there was always a kick on, which does help. And yeah, like as Michael was saying there, like we, we kind of needed this game because Saturday was a tough watch and the first sixty minutes of our man Donegal was a tough watch as well. And like I think the league in general was a bit underwhelming, like when you've, you know, Mayo openly ruling themselves out of a league final because they're going to New York the week after and just things like that. Like there wasn't that many big stories. We probably Kildare losing seven games out of seven was maybe the biggest kind of story from the league. But it's mad how like one good game can change everyone's perception of like the whole league where like we think of the league in 2024 now, we'll think, Jesus, like that was some game. But, you know, it's kind of like the all in finals in kind of 16 and 17 with Mayo and Dublin. You have a really good find and all of a sudden it was a great year. Like, so, yeah, we definitely needed that. Yeah, but you know what? I, I make a point to you here. Like, we used to think that Hurlan was unbelievable in 2009, 10 and 11. And that was also based on just a Kilkenny and Tipperary game, just kept the whole thing afloat. Michael, is there any hope that this wasn't the case of like Sigerson Cup type match that because the managers don't have that much time to, to prepare, they end up to some degree, throwing tactics out the window. They haven't been able to train collectively or whatever. Whereas in these football league finals so close to championship, every other team in the country is able to come in and watch what they're doing. 
that the teams decided to let tactics go out the window, just go mano a mano, and that's why we were treated as such a spectacle. Uh, I'm not so sure. Like Derry played, I wouldn't say it was maybe as open as they were last Sunday, but in the All Ireland final against Kerry last year, it was a, a newer kind of style that we've seen. Um, uh, no, I, 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 there's probably an element of truth to what you're what you're saying, but um, like like. <sighs> I, I, I kind I kind of think yeah there's there's probably a, an issue with you know time to actually get prepared for each other probably didn't learn much off each other when they met in the in the middle of the league as well but no I, I you'd kind of be hoping that this is maybe a, a newer way of playing football um and the dubs listen this is how the dubs have played in the last probably since the third round of the league to to some extent as well it's been swashbuckling it's been open it, it's been always on the front foot. Derry have put up massive scores as well. It was a 219 in the last game against Roscommon. This is the way they've generally been trying to play. Now, if they play each other again in a be it an All Ireland semi final or final, will it be quite as maybe open as this, quite as man a man as this? Poss- possibly not. But there'll still be a fair element to it. And it was just fascinating to watch. I was covering the first game and uh I tell you, it's an understatement now to say the first 60 minutes of that was was poor now. That was that was as hard to watch for an hour, but it just goes to show you when a game is tight, anything is exciting when it's tight, and it did get exciting coming down the home stretch. So I was trying to file my report, and then it was coming out. So I came out for the last five minutes of normal time, last five minutes of extra time, and then obviously penalties as well. And just, it was mad. You've been in this situation, Shano, as well, I'm sure, where you're working inside and you're hearing what's going on outside mm. and you're kind of you're trying to guess what's happening because you're not watching the match because you can't work while watching the match. And there's a noise, and like, oh, definitely a Dublin goal. And you go out, and it's a Derry goal. And it was like, is that why you have so many typos in your match report this week? And <laughs> I tell you, I read it about six times to make sure there was no typos in it. But it was fascinating, um, even just to, to hear the crowd that Derry brought with them uh, and how much it meant to them. And how it's amazing to think that five years ago they were in a Division Four final against Leitrim, who were also playing Division Four again, a uh, final last weekend. And it's amazing. I was chatting to Brendan Rogers about this during the week. It's amazing how the tide can turn all of a sudden and your mentality changes and you just start believing. And this was another element of belief uh, being instilled in Derry that they can do it, that they can do it on the biggest occasion against the best teams. And crucially for them as well, they've developed far more players throughout this year's league um, than they had at this stage last year, working off a skeleton squad last year. Now it has to be taken with the caveat of, you know, the dubs. Look, when I looked at the Dublin team, um, when I saw it over the weekend, you're thinking, yeah, there's there's faces that we know in the last year or so, but there's a hell of a lot of familiar faces still missing. Of the two teams, which which will improve more um, come summer, you'd, you'd imagine the Dubs, but mentally, this you know that victory will do no end of good for, uh, for Derry. Yeah, do you know what? I'm seeing a comment here uh, from Liam. Any comment on Con's no show? Seen a lot saying he's better than Clifford, but when he doesn't show up, he doesn't get the same scrutiny Clifford gets. Con's still a generational talent, though. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm going to be batting for Con as a long time uh, teammate. He's done, done it so many times. I don't really think he can be questioned. What What do you think on on that point, Keen, as a forward yourself? Uh, I didn't think he was too bad. Uh, like he, he was fouled for maybe was he fouled three or four frees? Like he was showing hard. Um, he probably could have got in for a goal for that backdoor cut. And that was a fairly cynical foul from Chrissy McCaig that time. But uh, I didn't think he'd done as bad as, as what the listener was saying there. But I guess was Dublin have more support up front than, than Kerry do for Clifford. So maybe that's why he, uh, he he doesn't really get scrutiny. But I don't know. Like, I think Derry should have won in normal time, definitely. Um, like, they, they had three big goal chances. I think Lachlan Murray missed one. Uh, Paul Cassidy and Ethan Doherty then went to take it around Comerford. And Merchant kind of put it out for... A forty-five, but like Dublin had a really quiet spell in the second half, um, and then like Derry were what about four points up with maybe seven or eight minutes of normal time to go, and like Dublin are just the masters of going down the stretch. Like you almost need that kind of few points of a lead because even I was just watching back some of it there this morning, and like so there were four points up with eight minutes to go, and there was four minutes of injury time. So in the last twelve minutes, so Dublin won four nil, and Derry only had one shot. And I was. It actually reminded me of the the twenty nineteen uh, drawn game with Kerry, where I think Killian Spillane scored a point for Kerry on sixty six minutes, and there was eight minutes uh, added time that day. So in the last twelve minutes, and Dublin were down to fourteen men. Kerry never had another shot. So like you, you always need that against Dublin. They're just unbelievable. And then like they, they worked that shot to Bugler at the end, and he missed it. 
and they still turned it over like an unbelievable tackle from John Small. And I, I, I don't know, maybe the free was a bit soft, but they, they still put themselves in the position to to squeeze out the draw. And then like like the goal, like I mean that that, that was a hail mary goal at the the end of extra time. Like I mean, whatever about hurling, like dropping the ball in the square, like in football, you never see goals happening in that situation. Like it's just it's very hard to work a goal when there's so many bodies in there and you're trying to fit a size five into the net. Like what there was I, the only what? place you could go. Oh, geez, uh, the only area. Now. But what? Michael, what did it did it remind you at all of a certain All Ireland minor final <laughs> there about a, two years ago? I was actually thinking that when he took the free, but they it was I'd say it's something that probably worked because uh, they didn't or it was a forty five, wasn't it? They didn't put it directly in. They played yeah. it short. They played it short, and I'd say I'd say it's probably the smart thing to do because the ball in had a load of pace on it, and it was literally just a touch, and it was possibly going into the into the net, and it probably forced them to have to reset again. They were probably set up for the forty five coming in, then they had to reset. It did. There was. I actually, funnily enough, I did actually think of that as the forty as the forty five was coming in. Um, but like that was it was it. it what Keane says is one hundred percent right. Dublin have so much credit in the bank coming down the stretch. They, they always think they're going to get level or they always think that they're going to win down the stretch. That's why it was so important for Derry to probably kind of hold on in that scenario or be the ones that, that, that won it on penalties. Um, but yeah, no, there, were a fair, there was a fair level of uh, similarities between that and a certain final in Nolan Park that broke all our hearts two years ago, definitely. So then how would you look at it, Keane, in terms of like the, the steel of these Derry players that when it went to penalties... And look, obviously, Con's penalty came off the angle. It was so close to being perfection. But then you look at the likes of Connor Glass's one that went in exactly where he was looking for up there in the top corner. They've done it before in a, an Ulster final against Armagh. They're a team who just seems to have that mentality. But then again, I suppose if they're not getting it done from play in the last two All Ireland semi finals against Galway and Kerry, you can look at it at the flip side. But they did hold their nerve in the penalties. I'll be, look, I am contradicting myself here because they didn't hold their nerve to stop it going to penalties and, and you know, being able to hold out Dublin later on. So, will you make sense of it for me, Keane, if you can? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's hard to know. Like, even I was listening to Mickey Hart's interview there and he said that no no intention of practicing penalties and never even thought about it. So, like, I know Derry had the experience of it and in the Ulster final last year, because Connor Glass loves roofing a penalty. That's, I think that's twice he nearly done it. Like, that's, that's seriously risky business. Like, one of these yeah. days, it's going to fly over, but... Yeah, no, I, I think, like, if you're looking at the three things that Mickey Hart probably could have brought to this Derry team, or how could Derry improve maybe on their last couple of years, like, and the first thing was, like, the squad. Like, I mean, they were kind of working off a skeleton squad, as Michael was saying. Like, they picked nearly the same 15 every game under Rory Gallagher and the, first, at the same two or three subs. And you look at the bench yesterday, like, Gary McKinless was injured when he came on. He had to go back off again. But, like, having the likes of him on the bench, like, Cormac McMurphy was a serious find for the club championship. You have Emmett Bradley out retirement coming on, uh, Ewan Mulholland after winning the club all Ireland with Glenn. Like even Lachlan Murray starting like three points from play. Like he's he was been waiting for uh, him to come in Derry for a long time. Like he couldn't even he's only getting a few minutes under Rory Gallagher. Like and he's a natural forward. Like him starting and even Dermot Baker. Like he was a serious find as well. Like he never played any underage minor or um, under twenty for Derry, and he's played every league game this year. So like to to have a squad now to challenge for an All Ireland. And the other thing as well, like, when Mickey Hart got the job, there was a lot of kind of talk about, mate, is, it, is it the right fit? He's a bit defensive. You know, like, Derry's transition, like, now this year is actually a lot quicker than maybe the last couple of years under Rory Gallagher because every time they turn the ball over now, like, it's they're playing heads-up football. Like, it's like they're always looking inside. Like, if you think of some of the scores there, the one just before half time where it was a long kick out, glass caught it, uh, kick to McCluskey, kick to McGuigan, point. Like, it's almost like Kerry and Dublin football where it's kick, kick. And like you, you need that to win all Ireland because like, if you're going to beat Dublin and Kerry in Crow Park, you need a kicking game because if you're trying to like sit on the ropes and run the ball for seventy minutes, like you're going to run out of gas. And like Dublin have kind of made a mockery of that like defensive system in the last kind of ten years under Jim Gavin. Like so, like they need that to win the all Ireland. And then just the belief thing that you were saying there, I was listening to Enda McGinley there during the week, and he was saying that like Mickey Hart will just be on project belief with this team now. Like he'll be telling them every night to go into training that they're good enough to win all Ireland and. I thought like there was kind of two things that kind of epitomised the, the Derry mentality, and it was when the penalties were won. Like I don't know, have you ever won a penalty shootout? But like if if you win a penalty mm. shootout on a sports day, like the first thing you do is you go run into the goalkeeper. Like you know, <laughs> it, it doesn't matter how much like how big the game is. 
And like after that 90 minutes, you you could have forgave them for doing a bit of a celebration, but they just went, shook hands with Dublin players. Like, you know, it's like, we'll see you again. And then the other thing was when they were lifting the cup, like McGuigan went up after glass and you know the way normally the players come up individually and lift, everyone lifts it. Like the, McGuigan just took the cup and brought it straight down. There was no like raw coming up here to lift it. Like, so it was kind of like, this is grand, but we'll put it away and we'll see you again. Like we want the big one. Can I, can I ask you, Keen, though, about the journey that Derry have this year? Like, we, we've all put them in there in the All-Ireland conversation, and I'm, I might ask you both in a minute, is it Dublin, Derry, Kerry? Is it Dublin, you know, I mean, what, what is the order at the moment? But if you look at the way Dunny or Derry are going to have to go from here, on the 20th of April, they've got to play Donegal, then maybe the winners of Tyrone, Monaghan, Cavan, that side, and then you're getting into a, a final in Ulster. And then that's before you head towards the Super 16s. I mean, Michael, it is a treacherous path. Like, they're going to need that massive panel. Oh, they're going to need a huge panel. And it's funny, like, I'm not saying they've peaked or anything, but they're at a, playing at a fairly high level at this time of the year, which is going to be, it's going to be probably difficult enough to sustain it. What are we at? We're April 2nd at the minute. They're going to have to stay in it the whole way through Ulster, the whole way through that All Ireland series, and then before potentially getting to a quarter final, semi final, final, you're looking at nine games. If they stay winning, you're looking at nine games in a relatively short period of time. Um, and and listen, it, it's it's going to be difficult to do that. It's probably going to be difficult to go through Ulster, go through that uh, group stages, and then go through the last three games to win an All Ireland. So you, you wouldn't rule out potentially them been beaten somewhere along the way and then having to regroup which mightn't necessarily be a bad thing that's not what they'll be thinking at the minute they'll be just trying to keep the train firmly on track but uh it was interesting to hear even what Keem was Keem was saying there they they definitely won't have lost the run of themselves on winning a league I did but I didn't like the fact that like the two squads are actually standing on top of each other in the middle of the pitch because it was like there were you could see a couple of dairy lads jumping up and down, and then all of a sudden you turn to your left and there's you know a heap of Dublin Dublin boys there. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if they need to be further apart or something like that. I'm I'm not I'm not so sure. Um, on that as well, like just I, I'm fascinated about the dubs too. The dubs were opened up the other day, um, more than they have been in a hell of a long time. And I'm even listen Desi Farr talking after saying that um, what did he say? Victory is a lousy teacher or something like that. They would have learned. A lot from that, and uh, they learn. I've learned a lot about their defensive setup as well. I don't see them being as open as that. Will they flick the reset button quite to the extent maybe that Jim Gavin did after a 2014 All Ireland semi final? Probably not. But they won't be nearly as open. And I'm even looking down through the team, like looking just off the top of it here: Evan Comerford, Sean McMahon, Key Murphy, Tom Lahiff, Ross McGarry, Killy McGuinness, Niall Scully. Um, even go down through the subs, Senem Farker, Darren Newcomb, Liam Smith, Padre O'Coffick Byrne, Brian O'Leary, Theo Clancy, uh, Keen O'Connor, Killian O'Gara. Like, you're looking at Paul Mannion coming back in, you're looking at Stephen Cluxon coming back in, you're looking at Mick Fitzsimons coming back in, you're looking at James McCarthy coming back in, amongst many other names as well. Their, their only goal, I would say, or their only focus is on lifting Sam at the, at the end of July. And that's why those guys will be coming back in at those kind of peak times during championship. Whereas you're looking at Derry, it's a flip It's a flip of it because uh, Mickey Hart actually won the league when he was with Tyrone in his first year and kept that momentum going. And as Keane said there, that project belief for when he said it there, he'll want to keep that rolling and try and win All-Ireland in his first year with Derry if he can. Whereas the Dubs, it's more, they're looking more at a longer term picture because they can afford to because they've been there and done it before. So they'll ease all those experienced lads back into the fray and there'll be plenty of new faces when they meet again. Yeah, and you know, in 2008, didn't they lose the first round against Down with Tyrone? Obviously, this is Mickey Hart and it was a 10-game voyage for them to win the All-Ireland yeah. this year. So some of the experience that he's going to bring is huge. Um just Dublin this year, like when we're talking about that unbelievable path that Donegal now have if they're to go through the front door of Ulster, you look at Dublin, they're going to be playing the winners of Longford and Mead, and they'll obviously win that, and then they're up against the winners of Offaly and Leash, and then they're going to canter through a Leinster final, and then you look at Kerry, they're going to play the winners of Cork and Limerick, and look, Cork do, they seem to be showing a little bit this year, to be fair, but we've seen this several years where they look like they're coming and then Kerry swat them aside anyway. The difference is just chalk and cheese. But Keen, just in terms of the order of the top three or four, if you want to include another team, what is the order of the All-Ireland Challengers at the moment? Who's your favourite? And then two and three. 
Yeah, I'd probably still go Dublin 1, uh, just based off the amount of players that were missing yesterday. Uh, probably Derry 2, maybe Kerry 3, and I'm not sure after that. I, I actually don't think it matters after that. I don't think anyone outside of that 3 is, is going to really do anything. Like Maybe they all go... They had everybody. Maybe. I think there's there's too many ifs to call away. Like, the best ability is availability sometimes. They're, yeah. they're, the best players just aren't available often enough. Like, I, like, even Porrick Joyce was talking there recently and he, he he wasn't talking as if they're coming back anytime soon. Like, mm. so, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'd be worried about Gaul and like, Mayo, Tyrone. Like, they have the potential to take out a big team, but could they win like two or three games back-to-back to win not Ireland? Uh, I don't think so. And would you put Donny Gaul in there at all? Um, I I definitely have them up there, maybe top five or top six. But uh, in, in year one, I don't think uh, I don't think they'll maybe win not Ireland. Yeah, Michael. Like so, finished fifteen points to fourteen. You were there. And look, before we get into the meat and drink of the match, I can't help but ask you about Jim McGuinness talking about injuries and stuff like that, right? So we we have a comment here from Park Gill. Thoughts on Jim McGuinness? Comments on the split season. Play Donny Gall played seven matches in nine weeks in the league proper exact in the exact same time frame in twenty twelve. He then played a dead rubber last week and played McHugh and McBrearty, and both of them picked up injuries. So, like, does a manager really have to take, look at himself and say, why am I playing some of my key lads in a dead rubber? And then the following week, I'm coming out talking about injuries and split season and all this kind of stuff. It just doesn't wash. Yeah, well, the league hasn't changed, you know, as Parrick says there. And we're chatting Park Connor, uh, Connor McCostle about this last week, asking about the split season. He said he loves the split season. Um, and he said, like, the league hasn't changed. Proximity of championship games have changed a bit. And if you pick up a knock, it's a, it's a bit tricky. Um, but I thought it was a bit rich as well. Uh, Colin O'Rourke was, was talking about uh, one of the players in his squad playing 13 games in 30 days. And I just thought to myself straight away, well, why are you playing him then? Why are you playing him in those sure. games? Why, why aren't, why isn't he, if, if you know he has seven or eight games with, we'll say, college or whatever it is, uh, or under 20s or whatever it is, why don't you leave him to that at the minute? Does he need to be playing his, his senior games as well? Defin- definitely not. Um, and I think McGuinness has to look at himself at that last game, as I say, a dead rubber game. I know he's probably maybe trying to get a bit of time into Ryan McHugh or Paddy McBrearty, but like he didn't have, he didn't have to play them given that they were going to be playing a league final the week after. Um, funnily enough, the, the way it, the way it worked out with Donegal winning the division two with like down Brendan McCall, down Paddy McBrearty, down Darrow Wheel, Owen Bond Gallagher, Ryan McHugh, uh, and probably a couple of more on top of that. It's worked out probably beautifully for them in a way because a load of new faces got exposure in Crow Park. Some guys that had played very little football even this year, thinking I'd like to Niall O'Donnell. Um, even Aaron Doherty, I think, was just back. Luke McGlynn played his first bit uh, of game time in a while. Jason McGee as well. And they were still able to win the game. And now that says something for them, but it also says something against our man. Like, I couldn't believe what I was watching in the third quarter at different stages. Donegal were kind of strolling down the pitch. And I know our man had a few chances. They went 24 minutes without a score in the second half. I know they had a couple of wides and hit the post a couple of times, but they looked, I have to say, they looked disinterested for long spells. And Kieran McGinney did come out and say, no, I thought this was bizarre, lads. Now, he said he, there was a bug in the camp, which is one thing, and I think Stefan Campbell had it. He said they had nowhere to train for the last week, which I, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. Um, I don't think there's a centre of excellence in Armagh, to the best of my knowledge, but surely you can find somewhere to train on the Tuesday and Thursday night. So they didn't train at all. They didn't do pitch sessions at all. So they hadn't been on the pitch in a week, basically. Um, and he was looking at it from the point of view of maybe they'll be fresher, um, they didn't look too fresh, they looked very flat. But I just couldn't believe in 2024, regardless of the weather, that they didn't have an all-weather pitcher. They didn't have somewhere they could go within two hours to train to get some kind of work into them. I, I was amazed by that. Now, in fairness, he wasn't using it as an excuse, but I just couldn't believe that that, that would happen uh, in 2024, to be honest. He's on he's on the keen a long time with Armagh at this stage. And even before that, of course, he, he was there with Kildare for a long time. But he was the selector or slash coach maybe under Paul Grimley back in 2014. And he's been the manager ever since. We need titles at this stage, don't we? And if they go through another, yet another Ulster Championship without turning the screw, without delivering something, and we know they're on, they've got Fermanagh first out and then they'll play the winners of Down Antrim. Realistically, they need to be making an Ulster final here. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, And look, it's, it's just hard to get excited about Armagh because they always kind of just let you down. And like it's hard to know. Like some people would say that like club football in Armagh is hectic, and he's getting the maximum out of what he has. And then others would say that 
you know, he's been there too long now and they've come up short in big games. It's time to give someone else a go. Like, it's hard to know, but, like, that was just the most Ironman thing ever, like, of the last few years. Like, how how they can, like, uh, Jim McGuinness can pick up a uh, Donegal team on the floor, like, in year one. And, like, this Ironman team should be so much further down the line than Donegal. And without all them players there that, that Michael listed out, like, even just McBrearty and McHugh, like, the two most experienced and probably best players, and, like, not score for, t- the first score was, like, 61st minute or, or second point uh, of the second half, like, and... The, and then they score five in a row and get, get yeah. back in the uh, yeah and, and then somehow managed to lose it from there like um like yeah when I heard that interview I thought maybe it was him trying to cover up and he kind of knew the the knives were going to be out but then he kind of just admitted it wasn't good enough as well so yeah look it, it's hard to know with Armagh like they, like they are on the easy side of the Ulster draw and they'll probably be in a final so look they're, they're going to have to they're going to have to win that probably to to get their season back on track. Just yeah, on, Mike, on, Keen, on Keane's point there, it was a mad game, lads. It, um, what was it? Nine to, or Connor Turbot scored in the 38 minute to make to, to leave Armagh a point down, 9-8. Then um, Armagh didn't score again until the 62nd minute. They were 12-8 down to that point. Then they hit five in a row to go 13-12 up. Donegal hadn't scored for 20 minutes. Um, then Keelan McGonagall levels at a 13 all and all of a sudden Donegal scored three out of the last four points it was a bizarre game really like how do you go 24 minutes without scoring let's score five in a row how do you go 20 minutes without a game and then score three out of the last four it was it was a crazy kind of a game but I, like that third quarter lads I have to say like I couldn't believe what I was watching from our man they looked thoroughly disinterested and it was only really when probably Stephen Campbell came on uh, Reen O'Neill and Ushin O'Neill added a bit, a bit of kind of pace and injected a bit of pace into things, but it was uh, just a hard watch for an hour, lads. But uh, like this, this notion that they're getting the most of what they, you know, out of what they have, and that there's, uh, you know, relatively, you know, poor county championship and all that. I mean, you've got the forwards like Andrew Mernon, you've got Rory Grug, and you've obviously the the two O'Neills at the start, but Reen O'Neill in particular has established himself as one of the excellent footballers out there. There's no end of talent there, Michael. I mean, that, that's just not a good enough excuse. No, you throw uh, Connor Turbot into the mix there as well, and Stephen Campbell, and that like they've like what what frustrated me most was you had I think Donegal were the second highest team across the four divisions in terms of what they put up score wise. Armagh were the fourth highest across the thirty two teams, and then we had a dour drab fifteen fourteen affair. Do you know what I mean? Like I just. It was like what we've done to this point. We're going to. I can see from a Donegal point of view why they maybe played a little bit different, but they actually controlled the game despite all the players who were down. I didn't understand from an our point of view why there was such a shift in what they were doing. Like they were already promoted, yet there was a cup on the line. But like it was just strange that they didn't kind of go for it a bit more. And as you mentioned there, like silverware hasn't exactly been plentiful. John McGinney's 10 seasons there. So you'd imagine they would have went fairly hard to try and get their hands on something. Um, but just, they only really got going in the last 10 minutes. And then to get yourselves in that position, to be 13, 12 up, up, having chased the game, and then to relinquish the lead again and lose to a team that's missing so many players and should have been flagging at that stage. Um, they've two, they two weeks to regroup for Fermanagh now. And obviously Fermanagh had their own problems and were relegated from Division 2. But that's definitely not a formality, I'd say, from an Armagh point of view uh, in two weeks' time going up to Enniskillen either. Yeah, and maybe you have another point to make in this game, Keen. but I forgot to ask earlier. Owen McAvoy, the, the centre-back for Derry, his two goals were absolute crackers. Is there anything better, whether it's soccer or Gaelic football, watching a ball hit the underside of the crossbar, down into the ground and back up into the roof of the net? Yeah, class. Yeah, it's always better when the keeper dives as well. Oh yeah, yeah, hundred percent, one hundred percent. Yeah, you have to make it look aesthetically good, don't you? Yeah, if the if the keeper rooted to the spot there, just looking at it, it doesn't look, it doesn't look as well. But um, yeah, no, I was just gonna ask just on the Donegal Armagh game, maybe Michael from Benata game, like what what would you lend like, or what would you put it down to like the first sixty minutes being so kind of lackluster? Like I was thinking from watching it, like is it a like a half empty crow park? Like, does that not lend itself to a kind of physical game? Because, like, they played in the athletic grounds maybe a month ago and it was blood and thunder, like, so... But I, I was kind of thinking that, like, when you can hear the players talking to one another and there's no atmosphere, it doesn't lend itself to that type of game. But then, like, half an hour later, like, Dublin Derry is unreal. It was probably a similar size crowd, maybe. So, was there anything from being at the game or...? 
Yeah, no, I was actually even looking at it and we commented the boy, the boys who were sitting by his beside said as well, like when there's when you can hear the players talking on the pitch, you know, it's a bad sign of a game, realistically. Um the crowd was very, like very, very small. It was a right crowd in for the for the final once it kicked once it kicked off, but there was very few in there um from either account. Even though when Armagh got going, they seemed to have a decent crowd there and there was a good few kind of roaring them on roaring them on at the end. But I think uh, I think Donegal knew that they could probably only win the game playing a certain way given the personnel that they were missing. They largely dictated the pace of the game. They were able to inject the pace, a bit of pace whenever they wanted. I just couldn't believe that, that Armagh didn't try and take the game by the scruff of the neck given you know the personnel that they had available to them and who Donegal didn't have available. And the fact that there's a trophy there. Lads, if there hadn't been a trophy up for grabs in this game, like imagine what the last 10 or 15 minutes would have been. At least there was something on offer. There was something to go for. I'm just, I just really surprised that Armagh didn't just seize the opportunity that was there in front of him. It'd be nice to be going into the into Ulster, given the lack of silverware and how few and far between trophies have been in the last decade or more. I thought they would have been going gung-ho to get their hands on the trophy, but it, it didn't look like that. And as I said, disinterest would have been the word I'd use for long spells from an RMA point of view. From a Donegal point of view, they, this is some bonus for them to win Division 2. A bit of deja vu, same as when McGuinness came in in 2011, won the Division 2. Um, took probably, um, I would maybe took a scalp, I'd say, when they beat Kildare in that quarter final. Nearly took an even bigger scalp in the semi final. I think Donegal could take a scalp this year. Will they win the All Ireland? I, I don't think so. But I think there's definitely potential for them to take a scalp, a big scalp. Um, maybe it's not on April 21st now, but could be late, could be a bit later when they have everyone back on board. Yeah, Aaron Doherty with some winner. Like the, the last few minutes, even Noel was it sorry, Ushin Connolly got the point before there and nearly said Noel Connolly to Wexford. Yeah. Sorry, to West Mead for Yeah, yeah. Um and uh Ushin Gallen scored a beauty before that. Keen, if Ushin Gallen can stay fully fit and get that run of games, whether it's over one season, two seasons, like talent wise, he, he really is up there with you know pretty much the cream of the crop. Yeah, no, he's a baller, unbelievable, and he, he's kicking his class. Um, like him and McBearty inside is looking like a really good uh, duo for Donegal if, if McBearty can get back for the championship. But like even like Donegal have, I know we're going to talk about uh, Down and Westmead next and maybe what Down are lacking, but Donegal have serious kickers of the ball. Um, mm. you know they're unbelievable long distance points. Like Kieran Thompson, uh, Niall O'Donnell, uh, Michael Langan probably we didn't see it from him on Saturday or on Sunday, but he can do it. And like in the and modern game, even. Yeah, and in like in a modern game when teams sit back, you need that threat of being able to throw over points to make teams come out, and like that's the big biggest problem for down at the minute. So, um, yeah, Donegal have brilliant kickers of the ball, and yeah, look, I mean, just on your points there, like that's kind of the problem with a lot of football games is that like it's it's nothing for fifty or sixty minutes, then all of a sudden like there's going to be a winner and a loser here, and it it gets exciting, and that's kind of the problem. Like even. Was it the Mayo Ross Common game a few weeks ago on, on TG Carr? They lost the signal for like five minutes or something. And I came back and it was the same score and nothing had happened. <laughs> like, that's the problem. And, like, you know, there's no better two lads to tell me if, if that was a game of hurling, you could have missed five or six points. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we uh, tell you, all right. <laughs> Ralph Peter says, serious question has to be asked to the GA here, lads. 33,000 for four of the best teams in Ireland is atrocious. Rugby has two games upcoming in Croke Park, and you can be guaranteed that the IRFU will sell that out. Also, Liam Mako once says, hard to see Croke Park sell out for rugby unless it's Leinster versus Munster slash La Rochelle. And this is a good uh, good one put forward by Adrian McGrath. Armagh can't handle pressure. It's as simple as that. When the game was tight, useless. When the game was gone, they flowed. Uh, then they collapsed again when they were in a position to win. Do you go along with that? I mean, do you even go back to the All-Ireland quarterfinal against Galway a couple of years ago? They lost that on penalties. But, like, Rian O'Neill scored one of the great frees from the sideline around the 45, you know, when no doubt he was completely jaded, tired. They lost on penalties to Derry in the Ulster final. Do you, do you see it as simple as they can't handle pressure, Michael? Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that. Uh, like, had they got over the line in one of those penalty shootouts, we'd probably be talking about a different prospect here. They just haven't really managed to get over the line in one of those one of those big games. Now, basically, when I was reading Adrian's comment, Rory McIlroy was what jumped out to me straight away, like in these kind of big surges almost when it's looking like a lost cause. You, you can play with a freedom when you're chasing a the game. Then all of a sudden you're back in the game or you're in a winning position and your mentality completely changes because you're no longer cutting loose. Um, I, I, don't I don't necessarily agree with that, but I don't know. Maybe the time is, maybe the time for them to be actually be in their peak and really be threatening to, 
be in around, you know, an all Ireland final may may have gone, and it's just it, it's it's they will get over the line. You'd imagine in one of these big games eventually, but it's taken so long. Um, whether it was the Ulster final last year or the big game against uh, against Galway a couple of years ago, you, you just they they need to get one of those wins. They'll play they'll probably play different and play with a bit more freedom and believe they're going to win down the stretch. But at the minute, they, they probably, I wouldn't say they're useless down the stretch or anything like that. Far from it. But they're probably lack it. They need that big win. They need just that kind of release valve of knowing that we've done it in this situation. I've been involved in teams where. We couldn't get over the line until you get over the line. You play differently once you've gotten over the line. I'm sure you've been the same, Shane and Keane as well. You do play differently. You just believe you're going to win down the stretch, but you don't. You, you can't. Uh, you don't feel like that or experience that until you actually go and do it in a big game. They still haven't done it. That's why I can't believe they just didn't really go for it uh, on Sunday just to get a national title on the board. Um, if we move on to the Division Three final, Westmead two ten down thirteen points. And you just look at the, you know, what we're seeing now, the rap sheet of Westmead in the last year or two. They got to that Leinster final last year. Then they went in the back door. Sorry, they went into the Super 16s. Now, they finished bottom of their group with Armagh, Galway and Tyrone. So they, were the beaten, they were beaten by Loud and Leinster last year, Shannon. Oh, sorry, apologies. Yeah. But sorry, they went into group two against Armagh, Galway and Tyrone. And they had that last second chance that would have knocked Tyrone out of the championship. Now we see what they're doing here. We've seen them in the Talsha Cup. Like... Are they the number two team in Leinster? And I know we just said that Loud had beaten them last year, but where do you rank them in the in the overall Leinster situation, Keen? Yeah, like over the last what seven or eight years, you'd probably have to say they've performed best. Like, I mean, they they were consistently getting to Leinster finals, obviously losing to Dublin, but like outside of maybe Kildare Mead, like it's it's hard to know. Like Loud have, have came in the last few years, but like Westmead to me, like always had like they always have five or six players that are like division one standard players. And and then they're really solid players around that. Like and if you look at like you'd probably say Kevin Maguire, Ronan Wallace, Ray Canellan, um, Ron O'Toole and John Heston. Like you'd probably say the five of them could play for nearly any team, maybe outside of Kerry or Dublin, like. And even look at the game on Saturday, like so Ronan Wallace was injured, Kevin Maguire was injured, and John Heston only came on, like so to to still do that and beat down without all them, it's it's a fair achievement. And even like Desi Dolan was talking about the younger players coming through and Look at like Charlie Drum, a fullback. Sam McCartan was unbelievable. I know he's been around a few years. And uh, Robbie Ford in the forward line, Sen and Baker only came on. Like it's kind of like uh, as an off man, it's not great. Like because you're looking at like these lads are going to take it on now. Like because you know Heston and, and the, them boys have been so good for Westmead, but they're maybe kind of pushing the wrong side of thirty. Like so, like I mean, it, it's only positive for Westmead. Mm, Johnny Appleseed says, "What did I tell you, lads? Derry the real deal." Westmead are the real deal. If the Dubs aren't careful, they'll be the new Leinster County taking Sam home. Probably a little bit of a stretch, Michael. A tiny bit of a stretch, but I was looking at them the other night and you're kind of thinking, as Key mentioned there, the lads that they were missing, you throw Kieran Martin into that as well. Like faces that we've seen consistently performing at a really high level for Westmead for over a decade. And now there's kind of new faces. Like, yeah, Charlie Drum, Drum was brilliant the other night. Sam McCartney, like a couple of those um 45s just brilliant even the way the, the way his kick and style and it was just brilliant it was brilliant to look at they obviously had johnny lineham going forward to get the the two goals the other night they'd probably struggle for goals it was funny um it, it reminded me a lot of the talchin cup final last year so all the talk was um down or mad for goals it scored eight goals in semi-final last year i think they were they didn't score a goal in the talchin cup final last year uh and me definitely got one or two and the other night, Westmead hadn't really scored many goals throughout the league and Down had been ripping it up. You know, they kept it tight at the back and Westmead, they didn't concede a goal and they got two goals themselves at the other end. And they were the, be they were the better team throughout. So, like, there's definitely something building there. And there's definitely something building, I would say, for the long term. You're kind of thinking, like, Jack Cooney had a fair reign in Westmead. I know Desi was in under him. You're wondering if there's going to be any slip-off. There's been no slip off whatsoever. Armagh beat them a point last year. They could have knocked Tyrone out of the championship and been in that All Ireland quarter final themselves. And it looks like they're mad keen to get back into those All Ireland stages again. They got a taste for it last year, uh, and they were not in any way far off uh, the teams they were playing. So they definitely look like one of the one of the up and comers anyway. And been in Division Two for a lot of those young fellas. For 2025 and going forward after that is going to be huge for them as well. So yeah, like you could probably throw a blanket over me, Mead, uh, Loud, and West Mead. I'd say at any kind of moment in time. Um, but we're always looking for 
we're always looking to say who the second best is. Um, I would say there's very little probably between the three of them. Kildare have the potential to be up there, but you know, as we saw, they're they're all from seven throughout the league, so it's they're very hard to have any confidence in them. But um, yeah, it's like Westmead are punished now, lads. They're playing eight days later after winning the league, and I know they're they're playing Wicklow, and they'd be expected to beat Wicklow and to beat them six points in the league. But it is a bit of a mad scenario where you're going kicking championship football eight days later, and, and you don't really get a proper opportunity to celebrate what is a massive day and another big Crow Park success for them. Well, injuries could happen as well. The more games you play, the more likely it is to happen. And like down from their point of view, they scored just six points from playing the entire game. Pat Haven scored, I think, seven place balls. So that's disappointing otherwise. Um, Charlie Smith, of course, like can't but mention Charlie Smith, the kicker, the goalkeeper who's gone to the NFL, signed by the New Orleans Saints. And I was just checking an article there that was on the Belfast, Belfast Live. And they were talking about this year, all 32 teams in the NFL will be given an additional roster spot under practice squads specifically for players who have come through the international player pathway. The yearly salary for players on the practice squad is 170 grand 700, that's pounds. But that <laughs> jumps to 600,000 pounds if they make a first team roster. That's quite something keen. Have you ever considered popping off to the NFL? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm not a big NFL man. No, I'd watch the Super Bowl and all that bandwagon. But uh, yeah, no, it's some story, isn't it? Like for like an Irish sports person to kind of come out of nowhere and take up the sport but um yeah did i read this morning rory Began and mark jackson are back back training yeah oh. yeah uh Began was part of a training camp with Monaghan over the weekend so chances that he could appear in ulster jackson probably less likely to appear i'd say a week later having not really played any league but it just kind of shows you they went over i think they were in uh the us for an additional three weeks while they were kind of looking to get signed up schmidt got signed up I don't know, them coming home would suggest maybe that there's less of a likelihood. And, and I don't know, maybe when you're looking at the age profiles of it as well, Smith is early 20s. The two boys are like, you know, uh, I think Jackson's around the 30 mark as as is Beg and maybe a bit a bit older. So like maybe they're looking at the kind of the youthful prospect of someone that they can develop or work on for a decade. Maybe that's more likely than the the older the older guy is there. But uh, it's an unbelievable thing for Smith. I think he's actually home at the at the weekend. Is he doing some sort of kicking clinic in his old school, his old secondary school, I think. Um which which is mad. And God only knows what sort of interest there will be as a result of him. And like and as I said to you Shano before, I very little interest in the NFL, but I will be following him fairly closely. And like when you look at those numbers, like making a first team appearance and you're making the guts of six hundred G's, uh Sterling as well, like Janie Mac. Um yeah, you can see how appetizing it would be, let alone the lifestyle of it all and um needless to say the better weather and stuff over around there as well. Sure, didn't didn't this guy Adam Vinatieri, who won four uh Super Bowls and his kicking was crucial in a lot of that, he played for twenty four seasons, retired at the aim of age of forty eight. The likes of your Beggins and so on could have a long, long time playing there. Where different story when you're when you've been playing it the whole way up though, and that's your you know what I mean? Like they are the kickers are kickers. No, nah, I don't. I don't. I, I don't. I don't think. I don't think they are now. And you have to. On what basis, they're, 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 Are you saying that Beggin isn't going to be able to kick for the next ten years? Am I say who would have more of an advantage? Yeah, but you know, you have to look at it from a business from a business prospect. If you're looking at a guy in his early twenties, um, you're you're basically kind of looking at a clean slate. You're looking at a guy in his early thirties. It's not a clean slate. Injuries but start going into I it. I watch NFL a lot, and you see that a kicker is signed up by a team. He has an absolute stinker. And then he's just cut. He's just cut, booted out by the team. Like, get him in there. If it works, great. If not, boot him out the door. That's the way they do it. So I don't think age should be in any way relevant. It's all about who can get the job, though. Yeah, but it's not necessarily age. It's you're talking about the kickers you were talking about there are guys that have probably played American football since day dot and they've kicked that ball since day dot. But is it not about you can do it or you can't? Like, you can either do it or you can't. Yeah, but there's absolutely no evidence that Rory Began can, can do it on an American football field, like apart from the combines that he's done, whereas all these other guys that you're talking about, they've kicked for 24 years or whatever. They've kicked at uh, college level. They've kicked at you know, secondary school level or high school or whatever to call it over there. There's more, there's more examples of them actually being able to do it. That's, that's what I'm saying, There's more because they've played it the whole way through. Like, who would you pick? Who are you going to pick to hit a free? Like some baseball guy or 
Yeah, you know, Shammy, Shammy Collins, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying if he's proven he can do it. I yeah, but he's not he's not proven. That's what I'm saying to you. I'm just trying to make the argument that you're gonna if you look at a guy that has you know gone his whole way through career playing American football at different levels, that's gonna be the guy they're gonna more most likely stump on. Or a Charlie Smith who it, you're thinking this guy is young. He's kind of fresh. He's you know we he's a blank canvas nearly at this age, and we can develop him, and we know he's probably going to be injury free. Touch wood for the next ten or fifteen years. That's all I'm saying. You're a coward, uh, Lewis Reese. Damn it, though. <laughs> you know the the Welsh rugby guy. Him getting signed up as an outfield player, three year deal by the uh, the Chiefs, who are consistently in the running for Super Bowls, and Patrick Mahomes as quarterback. I think that's the most exciting one of the lot. But we're definitely getting well uh, off track here. What would you what would you say about down though, Key? I mean, are, are like where are they in this pecking order here? Yeah, I don't know. I think like West Mead got the tactics spot on. Like they just like like the blueprint is there to beat down now because if you just sit deep against them, they just don't have the kickers to to score points from distance. And like it's proven, like as Michael said there, like scoring them that eight goals against Leash was nearly the worst thing they could have done because then Mead sat in against them and just absorbed the pressure, hit them on the counter attack. And like, like, they don't have too many similar players, I think, in attack. They're all kind of fast, strong, but they don't have the, you know, the ability to just clip a point from at the, even at the top of the D. Like they, there was almost desperation, you know, at some stages where they were shooting from bad angles and everything. And I don't know, like, so, like a lot of their players are more likely to score a goal than a point. Like, and you might think that's a good thing, but like in a sport where you know it's dominant, like it's more frequent that you score a point, it, it's not. And, you know, I think down, if you give down space and you want to play basketball with them and you'll play open football and can't, like, they'll, they'll reef through you. But as Westmead said, or as Westmead done the other day, if you sit deep, just absorb the pressure, stay in the game, you know, like, they, they got their two goals, like, the, the shot that dropped short, like, is there, is there a more dangerous uh, thing in football, like, a, a shot into the square? Like, even Basquiat's goal was, was a shot that dropped short as well. And, like, you're even thinking, like, we just nearly once and a half just, nearly do that on purpose rather than because it's not by design like you know someone's trying to kick a point and, and it ends up in a goal but um you know it's hard to know it down and it, what do you think of they kind of i suppose call it a loophole that like down are going to probably miss out now even though they've already beaten claire if, if claire were to beat kind of two division four teams in monster like i, I don't know connor laverty was kind of not whinging about it but he was kind of making that point but i think um wasn't at, at the last congress when they were Going on about the provincial championships, I think down were the first county stand up fighting for the provincial. So, you know, you you reap what you sow, kind of. Count, counties are going to have to stand up and say, look, we have to de-link the provincial championships from the All Ireland series. And I saw, I mean, I've been saying it for years, play the provincial championships before the league, but they're going to have to start really coming out hard against this because we already talked about the path that Kerry and Dublin will have through their provincial championships versus what Derry are going to have to do. It's insane that we're in 2024 and this crack is still going on, uh, Michael. Yeah, I know. It's, it's bizarre, really. Like You're looking at Kerry will have, you'd imagine, one fairly tough game in Munster and then they'll go into the, the group stages in fairly fine fettle. Um, and you're looking at what Derry will have to do to get to that stage with a trophy uh, in their hands. You know what I mean? They'll have... They'll have had to come through a war against Donegal. They'll probably have to come through maybe Tor- maybe Tyrone and then an Ulster, an Ulster final as well. It just it it doesn't really make sense at this stage. And like I, I would I would probably be agreeing. I'd be getting rid of the preseasons, playing the playing the provincials first, having no link between them and championship probably. Then playing the league and then playing the championship proper. Keen, how do Down go from scoring eight goals in the semi-final of the Talchon Cup last year against Leash to not scoring a goal in the final against Mead and now their next big performance at Croke Park not getting a goal again? Yeah, it's hard to know. Like it's just too many, like too many players running down cul-de-sacs, getting turned over, uh, too many bad decision making in the final third. And like even like I only seen Down probably once this year against Clare. Um, like on TV, but like it looked like Kiermina was almost he went in as a coach this year, and it looked like he was almost kind of building it. Like they looked like Derry at the start of their project, kind of uh, what they were building with the kind of running game and that and that. But like they just need more strengths to their bow, and like you know, it's it's kind of weird because like Conor Laverty would be open to that type of football from his time at Kilku, where you know they like to kick a lot and get runners off the shoulder, and you know, uh, uh, like I don't know, like. It, 
is it a skill thing? Like, can you develop uh, like a kicking technique and that if you're, you know, late twenties and that? Like, is it almost got to the stage where you have what you have now? It's almost like kind of develop your, say your your uh, your weaker foot. Like, have you got? Is like, would you think you've got to a stage now where if you're twenty eight or twenty nine, like you might as well just nail your 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 good foot? Like, can you really develop a skill like that at so late in your career? I I don't know. I think you. I think you will never. If you try to develop your left foot, if you're right footed in late twenties, it will never be as natural as your right foot. But I think you can get to a stage where you practice enough that you become just it it's, just becomes a bit more trustworthy. I'll give you an example of a soccer player, Martin Gams Pedersen, who used to play for Blackburn in Norway. Oh yeah, he grew up playing with his right foot, and it was only later on in life, I think midway through his teens or late teens, that he realised he was actually left footed. And then he was almost considered a left-footed player. He used to take corner kicks with his left foot. Really, really silky player. And I used to watch him a lot because back then I actually cared about Blackburn. Obviously hard to these days. But yeah, he was he played as a right footer the whole yeah. way up. And I was OCD as a kid. Well, I still am. And like so any anytime I was playing soccer or Gaelic football, if I kicked the ball with the right foot, the next time I kick it with the left foot. So, <laughs> no, you'll, be funny, some, like, you'll, be so, you'll be some crack to mark. He kicked it off his right the last time, lads. You know what he's gonna do. <laughs> yeah, but if I did it two in a row on one, then I'd do it two in a row on the left. You know, I'd make it up eventually. But you know, it's it's funny, like the the upside of O C D, probably one of the few. But um I think players can like even if you look at the shooting of the remember that um, Dublin had a kicking coach, was it who was their shooting coach there at one stage? Was it Mick Bowen? Or he was maybe the skills coach or something He was like the that. skills coach, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but the shooting practice they used to do, they became metronomic uh, from shooting from all different areas. And uh, obviously they'd do the whole wraparound so a player would be more or less hitting a free from open play. You know the way like uh, Dean Rock used to come up the left side and sort of wheel around the player and it was almost like he was just hitting a free over the bar but from open play. I think if you practice certain situations enough and you practice, for example, your left foot enough, you can make it very, very serviceable. But, Keen, like you're suggesting, I don't think you could ever make it na fully natural. Yeah, Owen O'Gara's figures were um, outstanding in that test, and they were abysmal, I believe, when he when he started. Um, he just worked kind of religiously on it, and Bowen, I think, really went after that. With You can definitely get to a point where, I, I always kind of say to uh, hurlers that are predominantly would say, Right sided, you, you just you, if you can get your left side, particularly an attacker, to the point where the defender knows it's an option for you now to go to that side, he knows you can pop it over from 45, then he has to stand up a bit, kind of more, a bit different. He can't just lean it to one side, so definitely think you can develop to a stage. But it's funny you mentioned that because um, McGuinness was talking about Kieran Thompson and just his value as a player that can score from what's you know, outside the scoring range now of Gaelic football. And Michael Langan can probably do it as well. That's why you need probably, particularly from eight up, I'd say, you need different types of players. And, you know, you mentioned there, Keane, down have a lot of the same type of players. And if you have the same type of players, then you have the same style of play. You don't have other options. You need lads that can hurt you from different areas. Say, Thompson can hurt you close to goal, definitely, but he can hurt you very bad from 50 yards out if you give him, or even that just inside the 45. So you do need different types of players. But I wonder now, with the way a lot of inter-county footballers are being coached, are they being coached a lot more to, you know, run off the shoulder or giving that pass or whatever than actually popping a ball from 40 or 50 yards? Probably, I'd say, probably the, the former that I mentioned there, I'd say they've been coaching an awful lot more to be giving ball through the hands and making runs and stuff like that, maybe more than kicking from distance because kicking from distance is invaluable. Mm. As we all know, it's been a dramatic few days in uh, Northern Ireland politics, but Justin McNulty, I think, has been probably distracted, happily enough, uh, somewhat by Leash winning 314 to nine points against Leash in the Division Four final. It was fairly comprehensive stuff. I know this was Leach from sixth time ever at Croke Park. Leash have obviously been there more regularly. We even talked about them being in the Talton Cup semi final last year, but She's keen. It was one-sided enough. Yeah, it was. Um, I, I actually thought the scoreline was a small bit harsh on Leitrim. Like at least, Leitrim were deserving of the win. They were the better team by a mile. They just had more class up front. Like Evan O'Carroll, uh, Paul Kingston, um, oh, uh, Owen Lowry. They scored one two. Like whereas I think Leitrim's top scorer was the goalkeeper with two forty fives and a and a one from play. So like Le Leitrim did look to move the ball. They were uh, they have nice kickers. Um. But I think, look, for Leitrim, kind of promotion was kind of the main the main goal. Like, the pressure was on Andy Moran at the start of this year. 
Like Leitrim were finished fifth in Division Four last year, lost New York and then lost all their Talchin games. And then like they lost Keith Byrne. Keith Byrne was the top scorer across all four divisions last year. And he's out. Like, Paddy Maguire retired and David Bruin was out as well. Like so like the, even for them to get promoted was massive for them. Um and I think even bringing in Mickey Graham kind of the, his value can't be underestimated. Like I think you know, like uh, uh, Franny Moran to bring in a, like a coach at number two that has more experience than him, um, you know, is, is massive for them. But I think kind of the biggest difference in kind of the games over the weekend was kind of the, the volume of turnovers as you go up the levels is is stark. Like, and it, like a lot of, a lot of the time you say the difference between the, the bigger teams is conditioning and fitness levels and that, but just the the, the execution of basic skills under pressure, like they just the big teams don't give the ball away often enough and. Or as as often as the maybe division three and four finals, but like you just think about it, like I don't know, say I, I don't know how many turnovers were in that Leach Leitrim game, but I felt like the, it could have been twenty five, maybe plus. Like I don't know, but like if you give the ball away, say twenty times in a in a half or in a game, like like that could be a seventy or eighty meter run, say to recover that every time, and like like the best teams like they do they do less of that, so they're doing less kind of stupid running, like if if you call it that, like so. Like, like you're putting up what like that could be an extra two k on your GPS like for you know just for giving the ball away stupidly so yeah no that, that was probably the biggest difference over the weekend but um yeah no it's it's good for Leash and uh, it's you know they're they're building momentum ahead of the, the off the game it's a really interesting point Keith because I, I watched Leash against Carlo in the Division Two A hurling final and I, it really struck me you know because we're, we've all been watching so many Division One games in the in the last number of months. And it really struck me how often players were getting themselves blocked down, which, of course, is the same thing. It usually ends up in a turnover. And rather than doing that running when you're deciding which direction you're going, you're doing the more strenuous running of chasing someone else. And they're dictating when you're going left and right. And if you have to do a feint and, you know, like that is much harder running. So it's a really good point there. Uh, Michael, anything else you want to throw in with that? No, it's, it's funny you say that. Um, isn't it so much harder running when you don't have the ball or you're not in possession like how often i've obviously played as a defender nearly all my life when you have the ball and you're bursting out you're faster than the man that's chasing you uh, and and vice versa like it's it's mad like when you're chasing back how often do you see say it's a two meter gap how often do you see the two meter gap extending to three or four meters whereas if you put those two lads in a sprint they'd probably be, you could probably throw, you know, a blanket over the two of them. It's just funny. It's probably a, a mental kind of thing as well. You know, if you're after making a mistake and you have to chase back, you have to really be at the top of your game to actually catch someone or make ground on someone. Um, it's funny. Yeah. Adrian McGrath says, Jesus, lads, one minute you're on about boring games and now you're analysing how lads shouldn't be taking risks with possession. To me, it's actually, it's more so turning good ball. Like, I think you should never get blocked down. In uh, in either code, actually, it's criminal. It will happen. Yeah, it will happen. It will happen. At times, you have to force a shot because your options are are very very small, or you need a score. Times run now. But I think in general, you just should not get blocked down. And a lot of the time, these these turnovers and getting blocked down are because a player is just not getting their head up, or not being smart, or not delivering the ball and taking on a shot when the pass is there. So to me, I, I don't know, is it about risk-taking? Like, I no, want to... I would say like it's also as well, you get blocked down a lot of time when you plant your feet in hurling, like, and you should yeah. never you should never really be planting, planting your feet. Yeah, how, how many blockdowns do you see, uh, just say Limerick play Kilkenny in the morning in the All-Ireland final? You don't, you, you wouldn't see, would you see five, six blockdowns even? Maybe? Rare. It, would be, it would be rare enough because everything is done at such a pace and decisions are made uh, with such clarity normally as well. If you're a lot of the time is you, see, you go down through the divisions, it's the same what Keane is describing about Division Four final. You go and look at the two A final or the two B final over the weekend in Hurling, and lads just do things a little bit slower, and it gives a defender an opportunity to get there or get a block when at the at the higher level you, you just wouldn't. If like if you threw up a ball with your feet planted in Division One, barring your fifteen yards of space, you'd be just be you'd be left. You know the ball would be taken off you. And you'll be probably left into the middle of next week as well. Mm. Keen, any further points before we let you go? We're just about to finish up the football chat. No, it's just kind of on the mental thing of uh, kind of it's you're you're faster when you're bursting out. Like 
they used to say about uh, Yaya Toure when he played for Man City that he used to run forward like a 100 metre sprinter and run back like a marathon runner and that's kind of the, <laughs> that's kind of the, the mental thing I suppose you know when you're a forward as well it's kind of you know you, you love going forward and then you're you know you have cement in your boots going back the other way but how, like, how many times as a, as a forward you see like to say you're playing inside forward you're making kind of dashy like 10 15 meter runs shall we say trying to create a bit of space if the ball if you lose the ball all of a sudden you're opening up to do a sprint that you would rarely do in a game do you know what i mean or your yeah. position would rarely you know when do you when when is a car forward would you sprint 60 yards in a straight line like never yeah, it's a different yeah. type of running, isn't it? Like you, you almost need to train that way, like you know, because mm. inside you're kind of short and sharp, and you're kind of running across the line. But then, like, there's nothing worse when you lose the ball, and then you have to open up and do a massive sprint on. But you just, I don't know. A lot of people would say I don't do it, but <laughs> <laughs> look, Keen. On that note, brilliant to have you on the show. We'll chat again soon. Thanks, lads. See you again. Ch- cheers, Keen. Michael, you uh, fairly much sandbagged me la- at the tail end of last week with your winner t- uh, stays on game. So, okay. <laughs> in terms of the premise of this, what Michael was doing was he was picking Tipperary iconic hurlers. And look, we're going to come and talk hurling a little while, but the winner takes all was he's going to give me a choice between two really good hurlers and the winner stays on and then he pits another two great hurlers and I have, I'm forced to make these awkward picks. So I did that with Tipperary last week. Now I'm going to do it with you and Offaly. I just hope you've left out one player because if if this player is included, he's going to go, he's going to take it all and win the whole way through. But I'd be interested to see what you do. Okay, winner stays on Offaly. Martin Hanami or Parik Horn? Martin Hanami. And I love Parik and he was Offaly's first captain, but I just idolised Martin growing up. Probably one of the most, I know he's got a a decent bag of all-stars, but one of the most underrated players of all time in my view. Wow, that's ahead of the 1981 All-Ireland winning captain. Okay, Martin Hanami or Damien Martin, the first ever hurling goalkeeper All-Star for Offaly. <laughs> I love my great time. There's three Rhinos men. I'm saying I like I like them all, which is very unusual. Um, yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd stick with Martin too. I, thought, I, thought, I think he only ever hurled one bad game for Offaly and that was his last game. As much of a legend as Damien is, uh, Martin stays going. Martin Hanami or Joe Dooley? <laughs> <laughs> now we're getting dirty. My my former manager. Um, I I I'd, I'd, I'd stay going. I'd stay going with Martin. Yeah, I'd stay going with Martin. Uh, unbelievable body of work throughout his career. Martin Hanami or Brian Whelan? <laughs> no, that'd be that'd be Brian Whelan every day of the week. Um, the the greatest player I've ever seen, and uh, a pleasure to have lined out alongside him. So Brian is there. Okay, and that's Sid. So nickname Sid. Brian Whelan or Michael Dignan? Uh, as much as I liked what Michael did on the field and what he's doing as chairman now, that's that's Brian Whelan all day. Brian Whelan or Johnny Flaherty, goal to win the 1981 All Ireland, of course. Oh, an absolute legend. Um, passed away in recent months, sadly. Um, it'd still be it'd be still be Brian Whelan, though. Yeah, still be like oh. like Brian. Brian got man of the match in every All Ireland he played. Uh, every All Ireland final he played up until the 2003 All Ireland club final. So 94 county. 98 county 95 replay club 98 club 2002 club like that's unbelievable talk about a man for he's a man for every occasion but particularly the big occasion brian whelan or pat flurry uh, it's still it's still brian and i i love i love pat and anytime i meet him when he's doing tg catter work but pat now fair to say now pat and brian were different types of players brian would have been a stylist now pat we would have had a bit of style but he played a lot of substance as well Normally, you don't mention uh, style at all. You're not interested in that. Okay, what about Brian Whelan or Liam Kerms? Uh, well, like Liam, Liam um, obviously carries over with the, with the football as well and was an unbelievable dual star. Liam, Liam's career, unfortunately, like when he hit mid-20s, he was kind of burnt out. He finished quite early. When he was there, he was unbelievable, but it's, it's still bright. It's still bright. Brian Whelan or Johnny Pilkington? <laughs> I love Johnny too now. And Johnny was my manager of Burry, maybe captain as well. Um, I, I actually still think it's it's like a travesty that Johnny only got one All-Star and that was in 1990. So when Offaly won all the All-Irelands and contested all the All-Irelands, he, um, he didn't get any All-Stars around that time, which I just think, think is absolutely bonkers. Um, but it's uh, Brian Whelan, yeah. But like, you're here blowing kisses at all these lads and then picking against them. <laughs> So let's have a kiss blown and just answer the question. 
<laughs> Brian Whelan or John Troy? Oh, Brian Whelan. Brian Whelan or Kevin Keenan? Oh, Keenan, what a hero. Brian Whelan. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is going Kevin's way there. Okay, that's it. Did you find it awkward? Um, if you'd left out Brian, I would have found it very awkward. That's yeah, what, yeah. because it just, like, he's the greatest we've ever produced and probably one of the greatest that the game has ever produced. So he kind of stands, um, he stands head and shoulders above most of the rest of them. But a lot of the other lads there now, there would have been some very tricky ones without him. I did mess up a little bit. I do feel that straight away that I've messed up. <laughs> That's why I left Owen Kelly and the boys near the end of the tip conversation. We tried to have some of the dirty ones at the start. Yeah, Adrian McGrath, I told you, saying you screwed the awkwardness because everyone in Offaly would accept Whelan as the best. Okay, I messed up, lads. I messed up. A <laughs> um, couple of other results just before we get into the hurling. Munster under 20, phase one, round three. Watford, eight points. Tipperary, 5-13. And Limerick, six points. Clare, 1-9. That was in Ballyagrin. The 2A final between Carlo and Leash. I watched this game and it was so tight for so long. It finished up Leash 222, Carlo 112. And Carlo had lots of goal chances in the first half, couldn't quite convert. Then the start of the second half on 37 minutes, lovely fetch by Mouse Kavanagh. Um, I suppose he was about 25 yards out, soloed in and buried the ball uh, to the back of the net past Ender Rowland. That put them 1-9 to 9 points ahead. For the remainder of the game, the final 33 minutes plus injury time, they lost by 213 to three points. This was comprehensive from Leash, and like a huge fade out from Carlo. They must be so frustrated. What happened, Jeno? You know, you've obviously I've only seen highlights and read reports and things like that. Like you get, you, they had themselves in a position where you're thinking they're going to kick on. They had a very, very strong league. They didn't try in any. There was no signs throughout the league of any kind of potential fade outs or anything like that. Like did Leash just up it two or three gears or what exactly? How did how did it play out? They definitely did up it a few gears. So. I think the the constant running up the centre that Leash were doing, you know, Paddy Purse is obviously a br brilliant runner with the ball. David Dooley's very good at it, and he got himself a couple of scores. I think John Lennon got a couple of points from wing forward. Aaron Dunphy running from centre forward. I th and then Tomas Key started to come into it. Like, just after that goal from Mouse Kavanagh, he got a brilliant goal into what looked like the top corner, roof of the net. And Jared Quinlan then, he ran at his man, one, the other corner forward, and scored a nice goal, solo and true, inflicted to the net. So I think maybe the pressure that they were constantly putting on that inside back line for Carlo finally began to tell. But also, you can't ignore the amount of missed goal chances that Carlo had. Um, there was a very good save from Ender Rowland when James Doyle went through on about 50 minutes. Then Connor Kyo, he went straight through, had a chance on 59 minutes, and he put it wide. You know, And it was really good play, I think also by Doyle, or maybe it was Mouse Cabinet just set him clean through. And you just miss those goal chances. Ultimately, they do catch up with you. And what I really like about Leash, and obviously, look, I, I had Willie Maher as manager before, and he does encourage those nice, sharp stick passes. And we talk about all the turnovers, and there was a lot of blockdowns for both teams in this game. But generally, a team that's not going that well, those stick passes will break down an awful lot mm. during the middle. Because it's a very hard thing to execute uh, stick passes while you're on the run. But a lot of the time around the middle of the pitch, those stick passes were staying in the hand. And it meant that when they went at Carlo, that the stick pass was putting them on the front foot and they were able to run at them time after time. And I thought that was very well executed by Leash in this game. Um, they have a lot of quality players. I was watching, I was like, they're in great shape. They're, they're playing some good hurling here. Ryan Milani's dominating at fullback. Podge Delaney, very good at centre-back. Now, at the same time, they are giving up goal chances, so strong teams will punish them a little bit. And then I have to give huge credit to Brian Tracy and the Carlo goals. He made an excellent save from a penalty of Ender Rowland in the 64th minute and turned the hurley across himself and still made it. Really oh, low yeah. in the corner. So huge credit to Brian Tracy there. Um, so uh, it's the funny Rowland would have known exactly where he wouldn't have wanted to go. I kind of, it's a funny one because I'm sure that's I, I, it always amazes me. And you see the keepers changing the, the grip for, for a, a penalty to try and get, create that optical illusion of where they want the ball to go whereas opposed to where they don't want it to go. But um, Tracy's a very good keeper. He was um, he was McDonough Cup keeper of the year last year as well. Just you kind of worry a small bit now from from Carlo's point of view, like one twelve on the board, comprehensively beaten. They're heading into Leinster now, where like it's gonna get it's gonna go up another gear or two now. That's a uh, you'd have to say that's a little bit worrying from uh, Tom Malady's point of view. 
Yeah, uh, Richard Hogan says that uh, Mossy Key has proven to be a goal scorer throughout some finish at the weekend. Adrian McGrath feels that's a huge blow to Carlo, surely. SSRI, is it fair to say that the top three McDonough teams, Westmead, Leash and Offaly, are better than Carlo and Antrim, who are in the Liam McCarthy? Well, that's, that's quite a... Um, I would say Carlo... I, I don't think Carlo got the best out of themselves, and I'd put them ahead of Offaly. I, I suppose you... Would you put them ahead of Offaly? And as well, we know with the players coming back, I think that they can start looking upwards. Yeah, well, like Carlo beat, beat us in the McDonald Cup final, so they are they are they are ahead of us in standings and deserve to be maybe when you look at it, we probably performed well at division one level this year. Carlo didn't win the two A, so you look at it like that, but oh I I I I don't I I don't like there's not much between the five. I'll, I'll, I'll put it to you that way. And that's the, probably... Isn't that a thing in a way that, that we're thinking there's not this massive gap between the bottom end of the Leinster Championship and the top end of Joe McDonough? Yeah, the only issue is that there's still a big gap from five to four in Leinster, shall we say, or from six to four, that yeah. you're still thinking Dublin and, and Wexford are, you know, a good bit ahead and maybe not Dublin from the league you're probably think, looking at Wexford in third at the minute Dublin fourth and then there's still a gap from five to six to seven to eight um, you know there's not much there's not much between that's why I'd be I definitely wouldn't be taking it for granted that Offaly will even get to the McDonough Cup final that's far from um, far from a foregone conclusion given the teams that we're going to be playing and those to be fair to Westmead some performances they put up against the likes of Limerick and you know Tipperary different spells during their run in the league they were very very good um what a competition you'd have if Westmead Leash Offaly Carlow and Antrim were all in it in the one year now it's probably never going to happen but what a competition that would be yeah it's it's kind of a, a funny one in hurling I, I, it just changes from from year to year i'm hoping Offaly are on a trajectory where they're going to be that fort or fifth or fourth or third team in Leinster in time but it seems to fluctuate from year to year all the all these teams they're able to get to a level but maybe not able to get to that next level and they all end up being quite compact um if they were all together in the same championship in the one year like if you were the McDonough with yeah if you were the McDonough with those five and then what are you throwing maybe thrown down into the mix as well like <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be a brave man to call the the top two or who's going to win it I'll tell you that Mm, you might go through the results there, and the, as we go down the tiers in the hurling, I don't actually have them in front in front of me in front, <laughs> well, in front of me at the minute. Well, I will. So, okay, the two B final saw Derry beat Tyrone. That was one fourteen to one eight. The three A final saw Mayo beat Sligo three nineteen to three sixteen. So that was a very tight game at McHale Park. In the three B final, Warwickshire went to Edirne to beat Fermanagh one eighteen to one thirteen. We might also actually talk about the Leinster Under Twenty Championship round one. Now, Kilkenny put up a big score against Wexford. That was 421 to 214 in Nolan Park. But I watched all of the match between Dublin and Offaly at Parnell Park, and your faithful won by 118 to 214. But by God, it was unbelievably tight towards the end of the game. Offaly were ahead for a huge spell of the game. Dublin made that bit of a comeback, but Offaly just about eked it out at the end. Yeah, um, I was getting very worried now, I have to say, with five or six to go because Dublin had all the momentum um, and they were getting on the ball everywhere. And anytime we put a puck out down top of the half hour line, it was generally kind of coming back. So it was a good sign of character from our own lads, uh, and particularly Barry Egan, who had a brilliant last five or six minutes, having probably had a tough enough afternoon up until, up until that point. For him to, to fire over the winner was huge. Um, I don't think Dublin lost too much in defeat. I, I don't know... They might have set up a small a tad defensively. It was when they went. It's when they had to go for the game. They probably started, mm. you know, playing a bit more attack minded. That was when they got back into the game um, an awful lot more. Brendan Kenny was I thought was brilliant, particularly very very good uh, on the ball for them. I was thought it was um, I thought it was unusual that they took off uh, Dermot O'Dooling in the last couple of minutes when the game was really really in the melting pot. He probably didn't have his best game, but I probably would have still left him on with the with the view to if they got a chance and even if it was a free that he had a good chance of maybe nailing it but uh this is one where i'd say awfully kind of survived and it was a very i i would have taken a draw and a, a loss would have a loss looked quite realistic to me with a couple of minutes to go so for it to work out the way it did and for us to have two points on the board i'd be, I'd be very very happy because it was looking very very ropey with a couple of minutes to go I have to say shano as well conditions were 
for real. Oh. <laughs> like it was oh, like it was, it was so soft uh, in, in Parnell Park, particularly out around the sidelines. Like if it went like most of the sidelines, I know that Breck and Kavanagh did a couple of times in the first half. Like he had to bring the ball in five or six yards into the pitch to get any sort of an area where you could hit a line ball from or you were just like striking into muck otherwise. Um, and I'm looking outside and hoping and praying that the sun actually shines um, for a couple of weeks and there's no rain because clubs, the length and breadth of the country, are getting hammered with facilities at the minute. Like, it's just, it's very, very difficult. And just to go through some of the, play, like, some of the other things that stood out from that performance, it's not the first time that Adam Screeny's free-taking has been a little bit unreliable. I think, was it maybe four he missed between the first half and maybe early in the second? I'm not... Could have been five, I think, on total, yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah, very, very surprising, but... Like, there was one time somebody hit a cross-field ball to him and it kind of came down over his shoulder and he touched it down to himself. I'm pretty sure he popped it over the bar just after that. But, but like, the things he does are so good. And, you know, this wouldn't have been a going day for him. Now, he scored a goal, but realistically, that probably should have been saved. But I'm going to kind of paint the picture for Dublin a little bit more. They were playing without their centre-back, Conal Loreen. Now, he came on the second half, but he's a very promising player for Kilmacud Croaks and he took a dunt in the head playing a league match recently, so I don't know if it was a case of slowly easing him back in, but you drop your centre-back out of any team, Michael, and obviously that's yeah, going to... Yeah. And, like, he's a very big physical presence. You know, he's very well filled out. So that's that's an impact. have to mention David Purcell's brilliant solo goal for Dublin, flicking the ball all over the place and eventually, you know, at the end of a long run and eventually putting it into the back of the net. Oli Gaffney got a nice one as well. Uh, O'Doolin, yeah, he scored six frees. And they tried him inside and they tried him outside. And, you look. Know, I, you, you, we've obviously talked about him a lot because I had him with the Freshers this year at Dublin. Really excellent player, but it just didn't happen for him in this particular game. But uh, yeah, it was a real killer just towards the end of the game. Dublin had it level, and then Barry Egan knocks over that winner. But like, what a boost for Offaly in the sense that, irrespective of what happens at senior level, you still feel like the momentum at underage, the more wins you get, the better it is. Oh, 100%, especially going up there um, and, and winning. It was, And it's it's not like last year when. Leo O'Connor would have had all these lads basically to himself. He doesn't have like more. There's a large cohort in on Johnny Kelly's senior panel at the minute, and like they would have, last year, they would have all played colleges together, the vast, vast majority, and they would have carried that colleges team and that Leinster win against Cairns all the way into the. I think they were in the were they in the weaker of the two um, Leinster divisions last year. I think they were. They would have had a lot less contact time with them this year, so it was important to get a win. Um, and I said. Just to win when it was looking like it was going away from them as well. And as you say there, like a lot of their real kind of marquee men, like Dan Ravenhill went off before half time with what looked like a bit of a bit of a hamstring injury. He was on a yellow card at the time. Screeny didn't light it up like he normally would. Dan Burke was probably one of Offaly's best players. Oh, took four, him, didn't he? Yeah, took four great scores. Um kind of know like he's kind of leaning back off that left side. He's very, 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 very good on it as well. Just wasn't it a Dublin Crossfield ball in defence that Barry Egan intercepted. I think that the, mm. for a second, for a second to last point, I think. Yeah, it was Conor Grork who um, he's a cooler man, really good prospect. I actually played a couple of third team games with him last year. I remember him being brought on at half time in one game. You know, he's such a young player, and he he scored four or five from play in the second half around the middle of the field. Like he's going to have some big days. That was just you could see him straight away when he hit it. He was like, oh no. Mm. But, you know, he had a really good um, game and no doubt he'll he'll have some very strong games for Dublin this year. Yeah, no, I still think Dub Dublin could have a... Dublin could easily have a say in Leinster if they get all the players back on the pitch. Um, like, Offaly, it was looking like midway through the second half, Offaly were going to win by five or six, um, kind of nearly with the handbrake on, but Dublin asked serious, serious questions. Who do you see as the... Like, I mean, we know for sure that Cork are going to be in the mix, but... And I might just go through, like, in terms of the betting odds, if you want to look at it this way. Galway are favourites, Kilkenny second, Offaly third. Sorry, this is for the Leinster, actually. But would you, like, find it very hard to decide who's going to be the teams winning um, winning the under-20 title this year? Cork and Clare at the very top of the betting when it comes to the Munster. Yeah, uh, Clare were the one team that really pushed Cork last year. Um, and there's, as you said, there's a, a good, a good decent cohort of those Cork lads uh, available again this year. Um Five just, or six forwards. Yeah, it was just uh, like how impressed would it, would you be like with you know the physical nature of those Cork lads? Like they're some of them like the the majority nearly looked like fully grown men, and that was in comparison to our own lads in the final who were of a much kind of lighter variety. So you'd imagine we still have a good bit of ground 
kind of make up um, in that regard. I wouldn't say Clare would be a million miles off. They're obviously they're had a, a good side for the last two years and they're obviously going to pump in a fair few rows all Ireland winner minors from last year into an under-20 setup as well. Awfully showed last year that you don't need necessarily need a second year or a third year to come in straight from minor into 20. So they'll definitely be thereabouts. I'd say Galway would have been um, disgusted with how they exited last year. They exited Leinster at the quarter-final stage having you know, given the talent that they have available to them, you'd imagine they'd be coming back a hell of a lot better this year as well. Um, I'm forgetting who's over the goal with 20s. It's Fergal Healy, actually, that was with them for the minors for the last couple of years, and uh, Canning and uh, James Skettle are in there as well, so there's a fair bit of continuity there. Uh, I think Leinster's going to be very, very difficult to, uh, to win this year. Um, and Kilkenny, Kilkenny made a bit of a statement, you'd have to say, with that big defeat of Wexford uh, last weekend as well. Yeah, like last year, Cork won every single game in the championship and to win the All Ireland, including beating your Offaly in the final. But the semi final, they beat Clare 123 to 121. That was a cracking game down at the Gaelic grounds. Keith Smith scored 11 for Clare that day, Ben Cunningham 9 for Cork. But Adrian McGrath, Clare man, says Clare's odds are nuts. Most are over age, will be looking to be solid this year. They're the ones that lost by 40 points at minor a couple of years ago. So that will, we'll see a fair bit in terms of like, what have Clare been able to do with that group of players in the couple of years since? And have all of those players in the meantime, have they been kind of doing the S&C with the county? Even if they were not necessarily in the 26 last year or the year before or whatever, have they still been able to physically develop? Have the county been able to look after that? Because that's something you'd look at counties across the board. Like sometimes a player, he'd have been a minor and then he goes ahead the next year. He's at under 20 level, but he doesn't get picked by the county panel. So he misses out on a full year of S and C, or maybe even two, and gets called up again. And I'd look at different counties and wonder, you know, how far behind are the likes of, I don't know, Tip behind Cork, or for for as one example there, or, or do Kilkenny have a step ahead on other counties? That that's a huge factor. If you've got someone who's done S and C for three years after a minor versus someone who's missed out in a year and then done two. It's funny you should say that because I was looking at some of the Kilkenny lads against Limerick and they obviously won the game, but I was looking at guys that maybe hadn't played um, or maybe it was their first kind of start at senior or their first go at senior and they're kind of as... It just is a different shape to certain lads when you haven't mm. gone through that and you haven't gone through that system. I think you particularly notice it in around the chest area. Um, a lot of lads that have gone through the system and gone through their condition to hold you up, you kind of have a much kind of thicker chest to you almost um, because you've just been exposed to it for far longer. But I thought there was a, a handful of Kilkenny lads that um, maybe haven't kind of come through that system. So you're, Mickey Comerford is trying to play catch up with them almost and make sure that they're ready to play at senior level and equip themselves as well, but you are playing catch up to a, to a certain extent too. Okay, so the final item on the show today is to rate the teams from the Hurling League this year. So this isn't going to be overly easy, and we're, we're going to rate Kilkenny and Clare, even though the final hasn't happened just yet. But you can see here on screen, that's the list of all the teams. And, you know, we currently have A in for all of them, but that's going to change very, very quickly. <laughs> Let's start off with Limerick. So I'll just give you an overview of how their league went. They finished top of the group stages with four wins from uh, four wins from five and a draw. And then obviously they went out against Kilkenny and it wasn't particularly pretty. They lost by 317 to 115 after going 1-2 to not ahead. So considering what John Kiley would have had to negotiate this year, which was the situation with Kyle Hayes, of course. So that certainly wasn't ideal. But between the verdict and the sentencing, they threw him back into the picture which meant that they, they they went through a full month of huge scrutiny around him. As soon as you played him, that basically offers this topic up for conversation, for questioning in post-match, which he had to go through relentlessly, which I would have thought would have been very, very tough for him. And maybe somewhat that scrutiny contributed to the loss to Kilkenny. But they were really, really good for the most part in the round-robin games. They beat Antrim, they beat Westmead without too much fuss. They beat Tipperary. Uh, they hammered Dublin, obviously, that time. They beat Tipperary, and then they drew with Galway, picked up a couple of injuries along the way, and then, no matter what way you slice it, no team wants to finish their league losing in the manner they lost. So how are you looking at rating them here? I'm probably looking at a C, but I'm not sure what type of a C. Um, I'd probably look at the group stages, and they did what they, ha they had to do. Um, we're undefeated throughout the group stages, but they picked up a loss in the, in the semi-final 
the, the like of which they probably haven't had in a while. I think Cork bet them by nine in the 2022 league. Now it's funny, like I don't. I I was looking back to stats on Limerick, and I don't even remember that Cork game in the league. I when I when I looked at it, I was like, I had to look at it a couple of times. Like, oh, I kind of remember that game actually. You just don't remember it because it didn't amount to a hill of beans in the gra- in the grander scheme of things. I wonder will that be the same with the semi final? Talking them training hard on the Saturday. They were obviously going out to Quinta de Laga. I think a couple of days later, maybe in the back of the heads, they were kind of thinking, do we need to be playing Clare? Uh, who were playing the first round of Munster, or do we need to pretend Tipperary who were playing the second round of Munster? I'd probably be looking at a C, probably a straight C, I'd say. I'm going to say a C plus just because the the manner of their victories against Dublin and against Tipperary. And even though, like, for 40 minutes, didn't they have 14 men against Galway? Oh, wait, I've put it as Clare there, but I meant to put it as Limerick. Um. Yeah. Listen. Maybe so. Maybe I'm. Maybe I'm kind of bit a bit harsh. It's just I'm, uh, there is a fair bit of stock in that semi final. Something happened to them that hasn't happened. That's been really uh, just hasn't happened a lot under under Kylie generally from 2018 onwards. But I'm I'm okay with a C plus. Okay. Richard Hogan says C is a bit low for Limerick. And could you just tell us on what basis, Richard? Because we'd be interested to get your feedback on that. Like they haven't lit it up or anything either. Like they they beat all the teams that they were probably expected to beat. Drew at Galway, obviously, with 14, and then ended the league on a bit of a sour note. Like, listen, if they'd exited after the group stages or that, and that, they'd probably be, you know, a solid a solid B. But there's that little kind of question mark going into the championship now after the way they performed in their last game. Yeah, OK. Um, Clare, I suppose, look, they've been unbeaten so far. Probably the, the only, they're actually the only team that's unbeaten at this stage. They came through a group with, top the group, I should say, with Kilkenny, Cork, Wexford, Watford, Offaly, which is certainly the harder of the two groups. And then they boss Tipperary for long spells at the semi-final. And look, we can we can talk about Tipperary's performance and they weren't great and all that kind of stuff. But I'd say up to now, obviously we're not going to include the, the league final because we haven't seen it. To do all of this without Tony Kelly, without Shane O'Donnell, without Ryan Taylor and David McInerney didn't play against Tipperary, I think you have to say it's an A when you consider all the young players that they've been blooding. Yeah, I would definitely go along with an A. Like we didn't know much about Conor Lean or... Keith Smith or a couple of handful more lads before this league really started and they've given all signs to suggest that uh, that the future is fairly bright in, in Clare you'd have to say and they've gotten to a league final as you say minus the lads that they're, that they're down like what's the, what's the league about getting game time into lads before championship and experimenting and blooding new players they've done that spectacularly well you'd have to say so I'd probably yeah. give them a. I'd probably give them a straight up A. It'd probably it'd be an A plus probably if they if they win the league. Um, but they haven't really put a foot wrong, and they've won a lot of tight games. Um, as well. So yeah, no, I think it's been really really impressive from uh from a Clare point of view so far. Yeah, Tom Spieler says Limerick A minus only minus for them is a flat second half in the semi final. The rest of the league they coasted and brought through O'Dolig O'Neill English nicely. Limerick prime for championship. Liam Mako one says Limerick haven't really developed anybody either because uh, besides Cahill O'Neill at wing back. John Bowles says that they're C in terms of their own standard. P. Well, 74 throws in Fergal O'Connor, Adam English and O'Dolig all played well for Limerick and now they're viable options for championship. The one thing for Clare that could backfire somewhat is ha- having to play this league final so close to championship. So look, we'll see if, if ultimately we're going to uh, view this as an A when we look back later in the year. Okay, Galway, they finished third in Division 1 Group B. So the matches they played started off with a thumping win over Westmead. Then they were beaten by Tipperary and at times looked very second best in that game, but still in all, kept Tipperary scoreless for long spells and brought it back close. Then they went and pummeled Antrim. That was 235 to 113. Beat Dublin soundly enough by eight points over in Pierce Stadium. Uh, had a couple of red cards there. And then 17 points apiece against Limerick and really sold it into Limerick, but couldn't beat them even though Limerick were minus Shane O'Brien for long, long spells after a red card. Yeah, that's, uh, listen, sure, they've kind of mixed the good with the bad. Um, you have, to, realistically, you, you probably have to be beating Limerick when they're down when they're down a player for so long. I just saw parts of that Tipperary game where I thought they were kind of bossed at different stages. Now they got themselves back into it as well. Um, I, and even in the closing minutes against Limerick, they were able to push uh, and get, at least get something out of the game. But why do they always have to be in... Uh, a negative position, we'll say, for them to get a real kind of reaction or for the, for us to see their best side. Um, do we know who's going to play three in championship? Do we know who's going to play six? 
do are we sure who's going to play midfield? Uh, where's Keenan Fatty fitting into the mix? I'd have as many questions as answers about Galway after the league, and it'd be somewhere around the C for me. Yeah, would it be more C minus because we just don't know? We just don't know. Like we're not any closer to the championship team that we're totally convinced about. Yeah, we're we're no we're no closer to knowing what way they're going to be playing at all, really. Um, yeah. And some would some would say that that that's good in a way because. Um, there's lots of lads fighting for different spots, but I'd much prefer to be of, I'd much prefer to be of the Limerick variety where you have a fair idea for 13 of the spots where, where lads are going to be and it's solid and lads have played alongside each other um and they know they know their know their role basically. Now I'd have yeah, a good bit of doubts. Can they turn it on come summer? Definitely can, but it definitely it was a league where they did not light it up. So C minus is good with me. Okay, well, look, Wexford, they had three draws, a win and a loss. But they've had a huge amount of injury issues. Now, Keith Roster is in his first year. So what has he found from his team among the games of drawn with Kilkenny, 216 apiece, drawn with Wexford, that was twenty po- or awfully one, that was 117 to 20 points, drawn with Clare, that was 113 to 16, beaten Waterford down there, 223 to 123, and then been beaten handily enough by Cork 321 to 115. Bit of a bruising defeat there. So what will Keith Roster take from that league? And how do we rate it? Yeah, I think you take a lot. You look outside of that Cork game, look at all the new players that have got into the mix, like Sir Richie Lawler, Keen Byrne, uh, Connor Foley. Connor Hearn's not necessarily new, but they've gotten um these boys have you know, they've kind of swam, especially without Lee Chin. Chin went off after went off early against Clare that day, and they're still able to put up a huge score. It finished in a disappointment uh, against Cork, as I said. But like I'd say, Wexford folk could be a good bit happier with what things are going to be like in four or five years when a lot of the elder statesmen step away with what they saw in the league. Um, I was I liked the way they play too. Um, I thought they were I thought they were good in the eye in the games that I saw. Um, less. Uh, less handcuffed by tactics, I would say. That's not to say that they're not kind of tight at the back or anything. They still are relatively tight. But I thought it was a it was better on the eye than maybe it has been for for the last couple of years. I'd be having them in around the B category, Shane. Like they drew it, they drew with Clare, um, they drew with Kilkenny, they beat oh. Waterford down in Waterford, drew it awfully as well. Obviously that Cork game. They were probably well well beaten in that. Um, again, minus a fair few of their big hitters. Probably given. Mm, probably like a B minus or something like that, maybe B but slash B minus. Trump Spieler says, I heard that some of the older heads begged Johnny Glynn to come back in this week, Galway. They should have been uh, on their hands and knees to get Joe Canning back. Canning's still the best club hurler in Galway. Says, uh, uh, Cyril, Cyril, Cyril has always been adamant about that. And he said, if, 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 like, if they're looking at anybody for a role for 15 or 20 minutes off the bench, they, that they should not be looking further than Canning and that they should be moving hell and high water to get him back. Like, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. But um, be would he want to, see. to do that? Would he want to be a sub and come on? Ah, uh, probably not. And it's not even. It's grand saying if you could be, if you could be teleported um to Central Stadium or Crow Park to come on for those last twenty minutes. It's grand, but it's everything you have to do to get to that position. And I'd say once you're out of that and checked out of that, you know, life kind of moves on, like doesn't it? And you're you're not making maybe the same sacrifices that you were. And there's probably some relief in that as well. I'd say. Yeah, Harburn talk about Wexford. They're a B, brought in lots of new lads, competed well, but don't know our best team before the biggest game of the championship. And that is the first round clash against Dublin on April the 21st. Aidan McGrath adds, Wexford would have been an A before the Cork game, afterwards back to a C because that was the first uh, game carrying expectation against the top team. And they folded. I'm going to say it's a C plus. Now, I make that argument on the basis that it was all looking good. And like Adrian says there, it was ramped up a little bit against Cork. But now things are looking a little bit shaky after the manner of that defeat, especially at home and not knowing your team for the championship. Yeah, it was an unusual one because um, I know Westmead beat them in Wexford Park last year, but they've generally been, they've generally saved their best performances for there. And it's it's unlike them to kind of deliver that type of flat performance there. Uh, I'm okay with a C plus. It would be a, a negative B or a C plus. So I'm okay with C plus. Okay. Do you want to make the case for Waterford? Well, <laughs> depends what type of case you want. You want made like if you're looking, if you're looking at their league uh, overall, obviously 
um, beaten by Cork narrowly enough, uh, beaten by Wexford narrowly enough, beat what beat Offaly the first day out, uh, got a couple of goals that day, took advantage of maybe Offaly going down to, to 14 men. What are the other two games in there? Um, yeah, so I, I was sort of looking at some of the comments there, but yeah, so that their run this year so far is uh, Waterford beat Offaly. You went down to 14 men that day, didn't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and you kind of capitulated a little bit, so won that game handily enough, won it by 12 points. Then lost by one to Clare. Then lost by two to Cork after going 10 behind, but played quite well in the last few minutes. Then lost by a goal to Wexford and then scored 2 9 against Kilkenny's 18 points. Yeah, um, I, would say, I would say it was a fairly underwhelming um, league campaign overall. They weren't beaten by much in any of those games. So to me, like a lot of it is just about how they're playing. Like they're not playing particularly well or they're not particularly good on the eye they're not really like what Waterford really excited me a couple of years ago this real kind of swashbuckling style not that they were all out attack but you kind of felt like if they got the ball anywhere that they could force they could nearly work a goal and there was massive pace and massive energy um now th- there's obviously the caveat of Stephen Bennett picked up an injury in one of the games in Walsh Park I think it was against Clare first round of the league actually was it nearly or second round of the league and he didn't play another minute Caelan Lyons is back, which is obviously a big boost. Desi Hutchinson came back in the last couple of games um, and showed that his eye is still well in. They were missing plenty of players, but again, that's no guarantee that lads are going to come back and be hopping come championship. Same same with Wexford. Um, God, I'd, I'd be looking at it. I'd be looking at a low C or like a D plus, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, like, who have they really developed? That That's the question, like, I just don't know who they've developed. They've a huge amount of injuries, and look, everyone seems to have a huge amount of injuries. But I don't like watching them. I'm not sure what they're doing. Austin Gleeson stepping away—that that never is a positive sign. Stephen Bennett, like his injury woes. You just don't know what way are they going to set up this year, co- coming away from that league. Like it was just really frustrating to watch them. And I did a video on the Patreon talking just showing basically the way Wexford were able to walk up the pitch at times and Paddy Levy was sort of marking space but nobody's getting pressure on out the field like he's marking it back the field but that only works if someone is getting pressure at the other end and I just came away from it wondering what are they doing with the puck outs what are they doing with the players that they're playing inside when there's someone inside how often are they doing short puck outs to to their full back line which are all the way out in the 45 and I, I just don't know yeah, I just I just don't see where the positivity is going to come from. Maybe it will. Maybe they'll shock us. But I don't know. I think like C minus at best. Oh, I think we're probably been generous with C minus. I'd say. Yeah. I'd, I'd say maybe like a D plus or a straight up D maybe or something like that. Now I I heard um the mood music wasn't particularly good um when they when they went off to, to Portugal for their training camp. But I heard they had a very productive week over there and they came back bouncing from from what I'm hearing anyway. Um, and maybe there'll be something there's going to have to be something that first day out uh, against Cork because if they lose that game they're under big pressure they're under big pressure to get any points on the board at St Munster if they lose that game uh, so that's going to be fascinating well, it's just all teed up it's like it's so much on the line that first weekend between Limerick and, and Clare and obviously between uh, between Cork and Watford as well um, I'd probably go I'd probably go D plus maybe or something like that yeah, Park Grind says Watford's great absence for test. Traumspieler Watford failed the mocks. Remind me of a lad who had prepared bowling for poetry but never came up. <laughs> Do you remember when it used to be like back in the day? The, the word always went around that, like, you know, you got like 10% for writing your name in an exam and <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> so, uh, moving on then to Cork. And if you were to go on the first 25 minutes of that game against. Um, Kilkenny, you'd be saying a straight up F here, but obviously they haven't been quite so bad ever since. But um, what are you thinking about Cork? I'm kind of thinking that they came good probably when it really mattered. Um, not necessarily came good, but they finished the league with a bit of a flourish. They weren't like terrible up until that point. They were just a bit of that Jekyll and Hyde Cork that we've come to know in, in recent years. Um, I just something has it in the back of my head that they got what they wanted out of the league. They're in Division One A next year. Didn't start particularly well. Um, 
there was a you know a bit of negativity about you know maybe the first twenty five minutes against Kilkenny, uh, a bit of a fade out against Waterford, letting them back into the game. But I think they got what they wanted out of the league. They've never really gone hard at the league, um, and you're expecting I'm expecting a Hopcomb Championship. Got Alan Connolly back onto the pitch, fit and healthy, back to back hat tricks, which is which is huge. Um, looking like they're going to have most of their front line men available to them come summer, which is what you want. Whereas other other counties don't necessarily have that. Um, did they light it up in the league? No, but there's that element that there's something coming, or I feel like there's something coming. It's probably like. Um, but do they know? Like, who who have they developed this year? Who's the new player? And I know Ben Cunningham was injured, so that obviously uh, means that he ha- doesn't have a chance to really show his wares. Owen Downey we had seen last year, but he's probably coming on a bit more, as is his brother, who seems to be improving all the time. Tommy O'Connell, yeah, okay, he's really stepping up again this year. But are they really bringing through any of these players where you're thinking now, okay, they're ready to take that extra step this year? No, we haven't seen any yet. Uh, ben Cunningham was probably the one, um, but he was kind of... Hampered, Mullins, but it, maybe? Ham- yeah, but like, how many, how much game time have these lads re- really got to suggest where they're, they're going to start come summer? Like, And there's probably... There's a fair element of you know Galway to them in the sense of do we know who's going to be playing uh, three? We do know who's going to be playing six. That's the one kind of saving grace that they have, and they have one of the best centre backs in the country in uh, in Kieran Joyce. But uh, they're still probably going to be relying on Hoggy and Seamus Harnity up front with Alan Connolly potentially thrown in. We're not a hundred percent sure of uh, Robbie O'Flynn's kind of fitness at the minute. I think he's crucial to their cause. Do, do we do we know where Tim O'Matley's going to be playing? No, no, no. So like, there's a there's a lot of players going into a pot there. Um, do we know where they're going to come out playing? Prob- probably not. I just it's more of a sense or a good feeling that I kind of feel like there's they're going to produce something or something might be brewing. Um, but it's still like a it's a C or something like that. I'd say from the league. Did we did we learn much about them? Very very little. Maybe that's the way they wanted it. Yeah, I yeah. It, if they had to. Bring through one or two more players, I'd say, fair enough. Uh, Cork realistically have 25 players that could start a championship game. So hard to pick their starting 15. To be fair, they do have great depth, and we went through that in recent times. The amount of forwards they have is nuts. Um, Tipperary, okay, right. So this is always easy for me to pick. You go through the some of the league performances, and at times you're thinking, okay, Tipper back. But if I'm to move away from that exaggeration somewhat, first day out against Dublin, very good, 227 to 22 points. Next day out against Galway, at times really, really excellent, and at other times worrying, like how they went long spells without scoring. And the likes of Garrod O'Connor was playing brilliantly back then towards the tail end of the league. You're thinking, you know, maybe played too many games, see a little bit kind of running on empty, not entirely sure. Then beat uh, Westmead, unimpressive that day, but it was a very much changed team against Limerick, I would say even though came back late on and got a couple of scores to take the bad look off the scoreline, which is good to stay going all the way till the very end against them, probably failed that test a little bit. Still think it's good to play that game just to get more used to them, but failed that test somewhat. And then, you know, won in Antrim and then the semi-final against Clare, solid useless, really. You know, and I mean, a lot of that was, I was very worried about the puck out setup going, going both ways. But I don't feel that it'll be as bad as that in championship because we've seen Liam Cahill teams and Michael Beaven teams set up very well for puckouts in other games. But also, obviously, the amount of missed frees and missed shots in general was quite worrying. So I think you'd have to say it's probably a C at best for Tipperary. Yeah, I would have said probably probably C minus. I'd say um, the mix there was there was definitely some good um, at stages against Galway, um, at stages against Dublin as well. Um, I suppose. They could have been beaten by eight or nine, maybe against Limerick. They weren't. It just uh, they, like there was a bad, there was a bad look to that Clare game. Um, and now all of a sudden, from being like maybe a, a B before the before the Clare game, or you know maybe a, a B minus or something like that. There's a good few doubts going into into championship now about them. But there was still, I think there was still enough couple of there was enough bright spots for them to be probably. Um, uh, what did I say there? Probably like a. C C minus C minus probably something like that maybe because there are there's just question marks now that less of which there were maybe before that semi final against Clare there's there was some there was some good but there was plenty of kind of bad in there as well and plenty of doubts now um that they're going to have to rectify fairly quickly too 
Yeah, and the reason that you'd have Cork as a C and Tip as a C minus, they both had like bad performances at times, like Cork's 25 minutes against Kilkenny was shocking. But it was at it was so far ago now that it doesn't feel as relevant, whereas Tipperary's worst performance was their most recent one. So that's why what, it's going to what, stick in the Worrying mind. thing as well is, you know, we're talking about teams that don't know who's playing where. We probably still don't know really who's playing six for Limerick, uh, or for Tipperary, I should say. And that's worrying. Um, that's definitely worrying to me. That's three and six are, are probably the two that you have to have nailed down going into the summer. Um, and it's the same. It's the same probably worry maybe that, that Limerick have even at this stage as well with Dan Morrissey potentially out and Declan Hannon only coming back and not looking like himself and Sean Finn not looking like himself as well and Mike Casey missing the last day. So, but from Limerick from Tipperary's point of view, yeah, you're just not sure who's going to be playing six and that's that's something that they need to rectify. Yeah, um, Dublin's performances in the league, I mean, losing to Tipperary by, what was that, 11 points, then the game, like, stole a result against Antrim thanks to a goalkeeping mistake, lost to Limerick by, what was it, 18 points, lost to Galway by 8 points, beat Westmead, fair enough, and very commanding display that day, but God, it's probably a D-plus, really. Yeah, the plus is probably generous, I'd say, really, Um because yeah, as you say, they were they were they were half steep that day up in Corrigan Park to get a result. Um, for the second, with a D, so I think I think a, I think a straight up D. Like again, I kind of mentioned this a couple of times. It looks like Donahue's first year as opposed to his second year. Because we we, you no, know, what 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 were the bright spots? Probably Brian Hayes, I'd say, was one of the bright spots throughout the league. But Owen O'Donnell was missing. He's had no game time since the 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 Walsh Cup, really. Chris Crummy's not, not not long back. It looks like they're going to play him at six, which is you know going to be a fair departure for him to come in at six, having not played county for for two years. Um, Donald Burke Lyons come back in to be fair. Donald Burke yeah. will only get sharper. Yeah, Donald Burke coming back is a, obviously a massive, massive plus. Um, listen, what was the game they circled in the calendar? Wexford in the first round of Leinster. That's the game that will ultimately define what way their season goes, whether they qualify from Leinster probably or whether they don't. Um, but it was it wasn't a good league. Um, it was not a good league. Yeah. Okay. Then Offaly, you finished bottom of Division One Group A, lost by twelve points to Waterford the first. Was day it tw- was it twelve? Yeah, I thought it was seven. Uh, three twenty to seventeen points. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I got mixed up. Stay going. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Drew with Wexford then um, were up by six points on Kilkenny, but ultimately lost by seven. 528 to 16 against Cork and really kind of capitulated towards the very end when Cork started piling on the goals and then lost by a point to a much changed Clare team. And we're in good position to win that game. So. I mean, you, you'd know better than I. Based on what you would have wanted before the start of the league and the blooding of players, where are we Yeah, at? But based on what you, what you would have wanted and what you would have expected, I would have expected, I'll put it this way, I would have expected a couple of beatdowns, and that's just been honest, because you're going into Division 1, the last time they were in Division 1, um, I remember Cork eviscerated them in, in Brendan's Park, and that was amongst, that was, I, think, I think they were beaten all ends up in all five of their games. Um, that year, that was 2022, I think. Whereas this time around, we showed plenty of signs that we can be competitive on a given day. Will we be competitive every day? No. But in time, potentially, we will be. Probably should have beaten Wexford. Um, probably should have beaten a much-changed Clare team as well. And had a very good half against Kilkenny. Now, I would have been in twos by what I saw in the league now, I have to say. Particularly with... like. Uh, Cottle King got game time, Dan Burke got game time, Adam Screeny, Dan Ravenhill, all these boys with game time, Mark Troy and goals, um, Donald Shirley got game time, like lads that wouldn't have the first time exposed to senior hurling and didn't look out of place. Um, I honestly I'd probably be giving them a, like a solid C or maybe even a C plus because based on what I was expecting, um, I wouldn't have been I wouldn't I wasn't expecting probably what we got, being honest with you, and it was quite heartening to see what we got. Okay, I'll promote that from a a C minus to a C plus. Westmead, then, do you know what? Westmead had a had a pretty tall order in terms of the the group they were in. Um, Obviously, you you have a game against Antrim, which they would have fancied, and also against Dublin. Ultimately, they won one of their four games. First day out, we've said this so many times about how Galway fill the teams, and it was unmerciful. Four thirty one to fourteen points. So to start like that, but then go out the next day and push Limerick. And I, obviously Limerick had made some changes, but they've serious depth in that squad. 
and they I think they had it level after about 64 minutes or something like that. It was it was very tight anyway. They lost by six for a finish. Then Tipperary, they were quite close for long spells and Tip pulled away. Then they beat Antrim by six. And the game against Dublin, they were certainly second best, even when they had 15 men apiece. But ultimately, Aaron Craig got sent off after 33 minutes, and that was all she wrote. Overall, I'm, I'm kind of torn a little bit on this one. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably still be looking at something in around the sea area, Shane. I think like, so, yeah. Yeah, because like, like they mixed it with some of the big boys and mixed it very well. Won the, won the game against Antrim, the one, that, the, the one game that they would have really been ex- expecting to win. Um, probably would be a little bit higher had they been, uh, had they delivered probably a better performance against Dublin. But to react the way they did to that filleting against Galway, I think is very, very encouraging. Um, I'd mm. have to say but the three games in the middle were very good. Um, they bookended either end by a very bad performance the first day and an average performance the last day against Dublin. But what what happened in the middle, I think, was was pretty good and similar to Offaly. Like you can't just judge them on the Galway game, or you can't really judge them on the Dublin game because um, there were plenty of bright spots in there. I'd probably give them probably give them a C. I'd say. Mm, okay, um, we'll move on then to Antrim. Yeah, it was a tough. It was a tough campaign for Antrim. There's no point in saying any any different. Um, that Dublin game was the one was the one they left behind. It, maybe their campaign would have been a bit different had they got a, res- a result up there. Would have left them in a different position going in playing Westmead as well because they would have already had potentially two points on the board or at least one on the board. Um, but like it, it probably it wasn't a good it wasn't a good league campaign. There's no point in saying any different. Now it's been there's been a nice little boost with the fact that. Uh, Keelan Malloy and Sean Elliott, Ryan Elliott and co are coming back on board for the championship. But I wouldn't have said it was a, a particularly good league campaign and I'd probably have them down in the D category. Yeah, but I suppose you don't want to be too harsh on any one player, but they did convert a goalkeeper to, sorry, an outfielder into a goalkeeper. And that definitely had a huge bearing on the result against Dublin, but also the, a couple, the two goals that they conceded against Westmead. So you could have been looking at a couple of wins there. And now that they have those players, you mentioned Akilah Malloy, Nigel Elliott, Sean Elliott, Ryan Elliott, but also uh, Sean McKay of Cushion Dunn, he's back, or he's involved, Cormac McKeown of Glen Ravel and Niall McGarrell of Glen Arm and Rory McCormick of Loch Giel. They have bolstered the panel a nice bit. And you could make the case that, well, that's not the league. We're reviewing the league. Here. I'd make that case. <laughs> yeah, so in terms of the complexion. But what I'm saying is they have their goalkeeper back now. And you could say that throwing an outfielder into goals changed the complexion of how that league was. And maybe we're looking at a false sense of where things are at. Maybe, but we're, you can only look at what, you're, what, what we saw, though. Do you know what I mean? Like, and you can kind of take all the little caveats into it as well. But and it's also like, it's far from a foregone conclusion that all those lads that were missing for the whole of the league are going to come, come back in and it's all going to be sunshine and roses. Far, far from it like they're facing the same dilemma that most other counties are facing with lads that didn't play league or were carrying knocks or whatever don't really know what they were doing in the background uh, and maybe they've been tipping away the whole way and they'll be at a nice pitch coming into the summer but uh, I, I, I'd only be judging on what I saw and I think a D is a D is more than fair Okay and then click any um, Sure they were very good the first day against Cork for the first 25 minutes nearly, nearly lost that game they weren't particularly good against Clare when they were beaten down in Cusick Park. They delivered um, a very good display. You'd have well, good a good display against Limerick. It wasn't they weren't unbelievable the same day? They took advantage of um, Limerick's frailties on the day. I'd say more than anything else. But like I, I don't think they've been outstanding or anything either. But yet they've beaten the reigning league monster and All Ireland champions by eight points in a league semi final. So you probably put put a fair bit of stock in that, don't you? And they've unearthed a lot of players. When you look at Luke Hogan, had never played league. Jordan Malloy had never played league. Uh, Owen Wall had never played league. Um, you don't know who's going to play. start championship though. Yeah, no, I, I know that. I know that. Mm, um, yeah. You don't know who you don't know who's going to be playing six as well. You're still in that kind of. You're still in that kind of weird kind of situation where you don't know who's going to be playing six, and you don't know who's going to be playing midfield. You'd say Jordan Malloy and Keith Kenny be playing midfield at the minute, but Shane after, Murphy might make it. Might make a play. Yeah, I think Shane Murphy was probably the big bright spot of the league, wasn't he? Uh, and he looks like he's someone who's versatile that can play anywhere from from probably two to eight. I'd probably give them a B, I'd say, but I I, I don't think it would be any. They haven't been outstanding or anything like that. Far from it. 
Yeah, so just to go through the results then, 2-16 to 16 against Wexford the first day out. Then brilliant start against Cork, but almost got caught by Cork that day down at Parky Cueve, but still nice to win down there, 21 points to 117. Beat, uh, beat Offaly after a dreadful first half, going down by six, ultimately winning by seven. Then they lost to Clare by three points. Uh, beat, a, you know, poor enough Watford, 219 to 18 points, and an obviously great performance against uh, Limerick. But are we putting too much stock in the, uh, in the Limerick performance? Well, I'm not putting that much stock in it. I just think you have to put some stock in it, but I wouldn't mm. be definitely... Like, I don't think they're near the A category or anything like that. Far from it. They also... Um, I don't know if they rushed TJ back, but he definitely came back earlier than he had before. Now, maybe that's partly to do with the fact that Ballyhale were finished probably, what, last October, and you had to bring him back at some stage and maybe needed less of a break than, than in other years. But um, I think a B is probably fair. Um, I th- like I th- To me, like Clare have been the team of the league so far, and they've been consistently good the whole way through while introducing a load of new faces as well. So I think a B is more than fair for Kilkenny. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree with you there. So look, the two teams in the league final have the highest rankings here as we go over it. So Clare with the A, Kilkenny with the B. The teams then are on C+, plus are Limerick and Wexford. A flat C, that would be Cork, Offaly, Westmead, C-, minus Galway, D's for Dublin, Watford and Antrim. And did I miss Tipperary? C- minus as well. So yeah, folks, get your comments in. If you're not even watching it live, you're watching it later on. Correct us if you think we're wrong, but crucially, tell us why. Is that it for the height of it? With it all yeah, a, a, a quick a quick go of the week. Um, a quick go of the week. I'd have Owen McAvoy from um, from Derry. Thought he was outstanding, and he's one of the new faces that that Derry have introduced throughout the league. Um, like to score two two from centre back against the Dubs in the league final in Crow Park takes some doing. Yeah, I'm trying to think who I'd give it to in the uh, Carlo Leash game. Hmm, I'm not entirely sure. Do you know what? Um, I thought David Dooley was very good. Like maybe he could have scored more, but he was just constantly running at um, at Carlo, and I think that broke them down to some degree. And look, you can't go past Owen McAvoy. Was it two two he scored in that game? Two two from centre back is outstanding, really. Yeah, it absolutely is. So just a reminder, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code our game and you'll get fifteen percent off. By the way, if you want to go to patreon.com forward slash our game, great way to support the channel. Also, there's two minute tactic videos. Uh, there's a couple of audio podcasts per week, like this show, some written columns also. And keep an eye out for our live fundraiser coming up in the Dome in Thurless. This is presented by Sean Tracy's GEA, Kieran Carey, John Milan, Seamus Callan, Eddie Brennan. That's going to be an absolute cracker. Have we all said, Michael? All said, Shane. Take her handy. Right. See you all, folks, next Thursday. <laughs>